do the minutes. Uh, Babawa, you may do the apologies. Babawa, your network is bad. Could you try again? Yes. Chair, I received an apology from the minister. He will be in King Soweto visiting the communities and the families where people were gunned down. And then I also have an apology from Honorable Patrine. She's still on maternity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Honorable Malekwa also, uh, 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 Marekwa. Marekwa is on an oversight visit, so she has also sent an apology. Um, those of you who, um, who are going to be uh, um, leaving soon or earlier, uh, Dr. Grunewald will also leave by 12. Do I have any other indications of members who will, will be leaving? Um, Honorable Shaky Mum is also attending um, a health portfolio committee and the chief whips meeting. Uh, do I have any other further apologies? Good morning, Chairperson. I don't have any further apologies, Chair. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, Chairperson. It looks like she's uh, out of the meeting. Honorable members, um, uh, I don't have any response. Uh, Babawa, could you list the agenda, please? Good morning, yeah. Chairperson. All right, there's Honorable Meshu. We were waiting for you. <laughs> I don't know how many times I said good morning, special one. Um, oh, good morning, but it wasn't, uh, um, We I couldn't hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm also going to be asked to be excused at 12.30, please. Wonderful. You are excused. Uh, you, any man. further hands? Uh, honorable members, please bear with us. Some of you are speaking, but um, uh, uh, we have unmuted all of you. If we can't hear you, please indicate. Um, we have the agenda. Uh, we have to adopt the minutes of the 30th of March. Do I have a proposal for the adoption of the agenda? Do we have Good a morning. proposal? Honorable Peacock, yes. Yes, ma'am. I move for the proposal for the adoption of the agenda. Honorable Peacock proposes adoption. Do I have a seconder? I second the chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Meshu seconds. Uh, could we now go to the minutes of the 30th of March?
Thank you very much. Do we have a proposal for the adoption of the minutes? Do I have a proposal for the adoption of the minutes? Good morning, Chair. Uh, propose for the adoption. Thank you, Honorable Peacock proposes adoption. Uh, do I have a seconder? Do we have a seconder for the minutes? Um, honorable members, do we have a seconder for the minutes? If not, I'll come back to the minutes. Um, honorable members, before you do uh, uh, lose me, uh, we are doing the analysis of the 2022-2023 Annual Performance Plan, APP, and the budget allocation of the South African Police Service. We are dealing with one of the largest budgets in the country. Uh, as we are um, doing this, APPs and uh, the budget allocations, we have to bear in mind that we have reached our midterm. And as a portfolio committee, we have to do a midterm review and analysis. I have requested that our content advisor and researcher, Nicolette Van, Van Selgos, does a template to track the resolutions and the decisions of the committee where those decisions which have been implemented will be coded in green, those which are work in progress in, in orange, and all those outstanding matters will be coded in red. We have to evaluate how far the SAPS has come since it appeared before the committee, since they have made commitments. We need a template on how things we have said uh, and that we have said we are going to do how those things have been implemented. And um, we are now moving to the last half of the term of office of this portfolio committee. The annual performance plan of SAPS provides us measurable performance indicators and targets against which we can measure the performance and service delivery outputs at the end of the financial year. The SAPS received a main appropriation of 100.69 billion in 22-23, which is a slight nominal increase of 221.5 million or 0.2% compared to the previous financial year. The department's allocation in real terms decreased with 4.1 billion. And for the second year, the largest decrease in the budget allocation is in the department's core service delivery program, namely visible policing. This committee has to look at the reduction in visible policing when in fact the country needs to have more visible policing. The program appropriation decreased with 508.3 million in nominal terms compared to the previous year. Despite the significant challenges faced in the Forensic Science Laboratory sub-program, the program was allocation, the sub-program's allocation was reduced from 1.57 billion to 1.5 billion. The Forensic Science Laboratories receives a budget of 1.5 billion, but we have yet to see the, um, the successful management of the Forensic Science Laboratories. 
We'll discuss that at the later stage. On the 15th of March, 2020, President Ramaphosa declared the COVID-19 pandemic a national disaster. The biggest impact of the COVID lockdown regulations was on the SAP spending performance, specifically on the movement of personnel and training interventions. Furthermore, procurement processes and spending on buildings and infrastructure were severely affected. The appointment of the new national commissioner and the five-year priorities. Shortly after his appointment, General Massimola highlighted his priorities as the national commissioner, and that was enhancing com community police relations, morale and integrity of SAP's members, the safety of police officers and the ongoing attacks on them, the DNA backlog in the forensic science laboratories, the backlog at the Central Firearm Registry, filling of critical vacancies in environments such as crime intelligence and the Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation, the DPCI, advanced and refresher training of members, damage to critical infrastructure and extortion at construction sites, and then the intensifying efforts to re re reduce cash in transit heist robberies. The, I'm not going to take any much longer further because, as I said to you, I have load shedding. Um, I am on a generator and I hope to have connectivity for as long as possible. The report of the expert panel into the July 2021 civil unrest made certain recommendations. Amongst them was the re-establishment of community policing forums, the development of a national security strategy, serious concerns about the breakdown of law and order in society. In the State of the Nation address, the president made specific mention of gender-based violence, the district development model. The SAP should indicate what is done differently at gender-based violence and femicide hotspot stations compared to other police stations countrywide. The SAP should provide details on the one-plan approach. And when we do this presentation, as I said, we have until two o'clock today, a thorough presentation um, has been sent to you, honorable members. I'm only going to give SAPs a half an hour to do their presentation, since I will allow more opportunity and time for questions and comments by the members instead of having a long presentation, which was sent to you more than a week ago. Honorable Deputy Minister, we have received a message, honorable members, from the speaker and the house chairperson, uh, as well as the leader of government business, which is the deputy president, that ministers are expected in cabinet every second week, and they will thus be available to the committee uh, during the times when they have cabinet committees and their cabinet committees are not meeting. So honorable members, if you ask in future where the minister is, and the minister is expected in cabinet, I will not entertain that, since I have told you that the leader of government business has informed us that all ministers have to be in cabinet and that deputy ministers will be sent to the committees to deputize the ministers. This is a, in no instance to undermine the committee, but to indicate that they are experiencing problems with, with ministers who not attend cabinet since they are in committee meetings. Uh, Deputy Minister, I hand over to you to do your introduction and then uh, Honorable National Commissioner, we welcomed you before. We have serious backlogs in certain areas. You basically are working against the clock. And Honorable National Commissioner, we have to put our systems in to ensure that we can do our work successfully. Deputy Minister, the floor is yours, and then you can introduce your team. Don't introduce all the, um, the generals by name since we are going to have connectivity problems. DM, I call upon you now. 
No, thanks, Chair, and good morning to you and members of, of the committee, and good morning, National Commissioner and the team. Uh, it's always an honor and a privilege for us as subs to appear before the committee in terms of the things that we are expected to do and how we are going to, to do them, but also to account on issues that the committee have raised. We take note of your opening uh, remarks, Chair, and we commit to ensure that uh, all the commitments we have made to the committee are carried through and those that are outstanding are followed up to ensure that we, we are there to the things that we committed ourselves to do. I know there is time pressure. I will not be long. I will take this opportunity to introduce the delegation led by the National Commissioner who was introduced to the committee uh, previously, uh, General Masemola, and we also have the head of DPCI, General Lea, and the Deputy National Commissioners, General Vuma and Zinga, and the CFO, uh, General Limpani, and other divisional heads and components that are part of this presentation. We take note that we have uh, to do our presentation within 30 minutes. We will try and compress our presentation as far as it is possible. And if we do go beyond the 30 minutes, I don't think it will be more than uh, the time that will uh, make the work of the committee very difficult. Let me take this opportunity, Chair, through you to request the National Commissioner to uh, lead in, in the presentation of uh, our finances for this year and what we are going to do with those finances uh, 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 for the next uh, 12 months. Thanks. And uh, over to you, General Masemula, through you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much, National Commissioner. Thanks, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members, the Deputy Minister and uh, the Deputy National Commissioners and all colleagues. The DM have already introduced the team. Thanks very much. Uh, without much ado, let me start by saying uh, the committee should take note that we have lost uh, a member, Sergeant Jora, in the course of duties while doing rescue in Peter Marisbeck, the female sergeant. Uh, she uh, passed on at the hospital and her dog have drowned. And we also lost a, uh, also another female sergeant from Devon Central of duty, uh, but of course during the floods. And we do have a member that lost a wife. May their soul rest in peace. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, without taking much time, let me allow the CFO to start with the tabling of the finances. And immediately thereafter, Brigadier Michel will lead us through the very compressed uh, presentation of the APP. Thank you very much. Uh, you may start. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Good morning to Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members of the Committee, our Deputy Minister, the National Commissioner, all Deputy National Commissioners, and the National Head of the Hawks, all protocol observed. Uh, Chairperson, uh, the table of contents is in the screen. We will be touching on the estimates of national expenditure for 2022, the revised medium-term strategic framework, the key consideration impacting on the 2022-23 APP, and Part C, where we will talk to measuring of our performance, which includes program-specific budget allocations and performance information per program and sub-program. Jefferson, on the next slide, uh, we will start with the 2022 estimates of national expenditure. Background to the 2022 ENE, according to National Treasury Directives, amounts are appropriated um, for the vote 28 police uh, 
expenditure allocation per program, expenditure allocation per economic classification. We wanted to emphasize on the slide that 5.8 billion additional allocated over the MTF to rejuvenate and improve policing capacity through the appointment of police trainees and absorption of those who have concluded their training into constables. In the next slide, we are having the budget and that is compiled for three years, but it is revised annually for the 2022 MTF. The outer year, which is 2024-25, is added. There are aspects that influences the baseline or changes to the baseline, such as substantial budget reductions experienced in previous financial years, as well as inflationary increases. In the next slide, Chair, the Department received its allocation letter for vote 28 for the 2022, 23 to 24, 25 financial year. We had initial allocation in terms of our departmental baseline for 22, 23. The department is allocated 96,857 billion with 23, 24 allocation at 96,083 billion with the outer at 101,443 billion. We then had baseline increases in the main to cater for compensation of employees at 3,837 billion for the first year and 1,935 for the second year with 2,930 on the outer year. This compensation of employees basically was to cater for the PSCBC agreement one of 2021 carry through costs at 2,867 billion that was allocated for 23. 22-23 financial year. We also had additional allocation for our enlistments with 969 million for 22-23 financial year and an allocation of 1.935 billion for 23-24 financial year with 2.930 billion for the outer year. All in all, the final allocation was 100,695 billion for 22-23 financial year with 99,018 billion for the 23-24 financial year with 104,373 billion allocated for 24-25 financial years. The next slide indicates the 2022 MTF baseline spending trends. This uh, chairperson we've excluded once of provisions as well as adjusted expenditure um, estimates. We are indicating it for a period of seven years, just an average annual growth for the vote, which is standing at 2.5%. In the next slide, a chairperson allocation per financial program. Programs reflect broad purpose and functions on which funds are expended. We are indicating average growth as well as weights per program. For program one, which is administration for the 2022-23 financial year, 20,361 billion is allocated to this program with an average growth of 1,1%. Program one weights 20,2% uh, of the total allocation. Visible policing, which is program two for the 2022-23 financial year, 51,716 billion is allocated to this program. The average growth is 1%. This program is the biggest program with a weight of 51.5%. Detective services program three for the 2022-23 financial year, 20,76% zero billion is allocated to this program with an average growth rate of two percent this program weighs 20.5 percent crime intelligence program four it's an allocation of 4.362 billion for the financial year 22-23 this program's average growth rate is 1.5 percent and it weighs 4.3 percent of the total budget. Program five, protection and security services, is allocated 3.496 billion. This program weighs 3.5 percent. It has an average growth rate for the 2021, 22 to 24, 25 of 1.3 percent. Average growth rate for program two was affect, affected by reduced growth between 21-22 and 22-23 when once of allocations and rollover amounts were allocated in the previous financial year. Man General average growth on all programs are affected by once of PSCBC agreement allocations in 22-23. 
in the next slide, this uh, pie indicates weight of economic classifications in terms of the 22-23 financial year compensation of employees weighs 78.6%, with goods and services weighing 16.6%, and transfer payments weighing 1.3%, with capital payments at 3.5%. The next slide indicates allocations per economic classification. These are the items which represent goods and services to pursue purposes and functions. The um, economic classifications in terms of current payments, we are having compensation of employees with an allocation of 79,137 billion for the 22-23 financial year. This line items average growth is at 1.2% and it weighs 78.3%. Uh, Goods and services, an allocation of 16.736 billion. Uh, this line item as average growth is 2.5% with a weight of 16.7%. Transfer and subsidies, there's an allocation of 1.259 billion for the financial year average growth rate, you will notice that there is a decrease of 11.4%. And this uh, reduction on transfers and subsidies is affected by once off amounts for the last group of government early retirement initiative exist, as well as rollover amounts that was allocated and paid for in the previous financial year. Payments for capital assets, there is an allocation of 3.562 billion for the financial year 2022-23, with an average growth of 2.6%. This line item weighs 3.6% percent of the total allocation buildings and other fixed structures there's an allocation of 981 million for the financial year 22-23 there's an average growth rate of 1.9 percent the total weight of this line item is one percent machinery and equipment allocation of 2.594 uh, billion for 22-23 financial year. This line item weighs 2.7% of the total allocation with an average growth rate of 3%. Average growth rate of compensations uh, is affected by once of PSCBC agreement allocation in the 2022-23 financial year. The next slide, uh, Chairperson, indicates the composition of the compensation budget and picking the 79,137 billion of compensation billion as follows. We have the wage bill, which takes into account the salaries, pensions, service bonuses, enlistment, et cetera, at an allocation of 59,368 billion for the 22-23 financial year. There's no provision for cost of living salary adjustment. This was as per National Treasury um, Human Resource uh, Planning Tool as well as compensation guidelines. We have made a provision for pay progression at 681 million, great progressions to cater for current agreements at 111 million, and allowances, uh, which takes into account your night shifts, your public holidays, et cetera. We have made a provision of 2,268 billion for the financial year. The PSCBC monthly non-pensionable allowance is catered for with an amount of 2,868 billion. Over time, with 739 million allocated for 22-23 financial year, rental and housing allowance at 3.083 billion for the financial year, and the two medical schemes, Palmet and GEMS, at 10.019 billion for the financial year. We have general remarks, uh, Chairperson, that we have made in terms of the MTF funding analysis. Personnel is the primary cost driver in the world police, and it also drives direct operational expenditures. Compensation of employees at 78% of the vote is therefore annually determined from zero, taking into account existing personnel and new personnel where after they are apportioned between programs. Operational expenditures are predominant goods and services, machinery and equipment in order to perform uh, duties. This budget is essentially uh, consisting of three types, compensation budget, operational budget, as well as capital budget. Chair, there will be a focus in terms of spending for the 22-23 up to 24-25 financial year especially on goods and services and capital investment. We will continue to invest in technology 
also gender-based violence uh, as well as additional emphasis on FCS units. So funding focus uh, on gender-based violence is also catered for. We will sustain forensic services baseline allocation previous, as previously increased to allow for the implementation of the amended DNA bill. We will also sustain the DPCI baseline allocation as recently increased. Uh, professionalizing of the police service through investment in skills development. We are also going to focus our funding on the capacitation of functionalities pertaining to cybercrime and specialized multidisciplinary units, investing in capital assets, uh, which consists of machinery and equipment, essential transport assets, as well as procurement of mobile police stations. We will further focus on the critical procurement of critical items to equip members for effective policing, such as bulletproof vests, uniform, et cetera, and also to continue to capacitate our existing POP units, as well as interventions through deployments across the country. Chair, the departmental spending over the MTF will be in relation to the core programs with visible policing accounting for more than 51% weight of the total vote in the 2022-23 financial year. The detective service program in terms of weight is also a significant portion of more than 20%. Compensation of employees will remain the largest driver of spending, constituting more than 78% of the total budget for the 2022-23 financial year, providing for remuneration costs and personnel numbers over a period. Operational expenditure, including goods and services, transfer payments, and payments for capital assets comprises less than 22% of the total budget in 22-23. The growth rate for the vote from 21-22 to 24-25 uh, financial years is 2.7%, with no real growth if inflation is discounted. The average growth rate is affected by substantial budget reductions in the previous MTF, especially on compensation of employees. But additional funding allocated over the MTF will eliminate estimated reduced numbers and allow for recovery to some extent. Chair, this concludes the portion on the budget. The next slide will then touch on the revised medium-term strategic framework for 2019 to 2024 and the national annual strategic plan for 2022-23 financial year. With Chairperson's permission, I will hand over to Brigadier Mitchell to take the committee through. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good morning, Chairperson, Honourable Members, uh, our DM, National Commissioner, National Head DPCI, as well as our Deputy National Commissioners, to provide the committee the assurance that the medium-term strategic framework 2019 to 2024, as revised um, during 2020-21, was taken into account and is visible in our annual performance plan, the detail of which will be presented shortly. In addition to that, the National Annual Strategic Plan, which was introduced in 22-23, has also been taken into consideration as facilitated by the DPME. Just a couple of key considerations that impacted on the APP. We compiled two addendums in 1920, the addendum to revise the crime targets in line with the 2019 State of the Nation pronouncement regarding violent crime, and then the presidency required that all departments review their 2021 APPs based on COVID-19 as well as the special adjustment budget. Our performance indicators have remained relatively consistent over the three years that comprise the current strategic period, 95, 2021, 93, 21, 22, and 95 again in 22, 23. And I will point out those indicators that we have added um, the DPME, National Treasury and Department of Women did assess our annual performance plan through two submissions, the first being on the 31st of October, the second being on the 4th of February. And in the feedback that we received um, after the second submission on the 4th of February, we received confirmation that the recommendations had been taken into account. In terms of measuring our performance, Looking at program one administration, I'm not going to touch on the program specific budget allocations. There's a marginal increase for program one and the breakdown for each one of the sub programs is evident in the, the presentation that has been provided. 
In the interests of time, I will touch on a couple of key issues within each program. So for example, the number of new police stations established, we did target three during 21-22, Muka, Vuma, Mabis Kral, as well as Rimfasmark. Rimfasmark, unfortunately, for the reasons indicated, was carried over to 22-23. We have a new performance indicator, number of identified CCTV sites implemented, where we are targeting 102 for 22-23, the majority of which will be police stations. The training uh, members will be familiar with the training categories that we have reflected in the annual performance plan. We have a new performance indicator in the form of leadership and management development programs, which has in, been introduced and is aligned to the ministerial program of action. Um, Moving on to the percentage, perhaps apologies, Chairperson, if I can just move back, percentage decrease in the number of confirmed incidents of irregular expenditure, just to point out that this is linked to the DPSA's directive regarding the inclusion of this indicator in the HOD's performance agreement, and these medium-term targets are provided to us by the DPME, the DPSA. The same principle is applicable in respect of this indicator, percentage decrease in the number of incidents of fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Um, members will be familiar with the audits, the planned forensic investigations, as well as the percentage of inspections. We have completed a corporate governance framework for the SAPs with a concomitant uh, implementation plan, and we are targeting 50% implementation for that implementation plan in the upcoming financial year. Program two, visible policing, looking at the sub-programs, crime prevention, um, again, we have, as General Dampani indicated, we have a marginal decrease in terms of the allocation to the budget for this program. Looking at the performance indicators that reside within the subprogram crime prevention, I'm going to touch on the uh, percentage reduction in the number of reported contact crimes, where we estimate an 11.8% increase at the end of the third quarter of 21-22, which necessitated that we revise this target upwards from 7.48 to 8.95. The same principle was applicable in terms of the 30 high contact crime weight stations. We anticipate an increase of 10.5 and we had to revise the 7.42 indicator from the previous financial year up to 8.75. The um, percentage reduction in the number of reported contact crimes against women, there we anticipate a 2.1% increase the previous target was 6.9%. We've revised that upwards to 7.2%. And in terms of the number of reported contact crimes against children, we anticipate a decrease of 7.9%. However, we've elected to maintain the target at 6.73%. Um, just to touch on the number of cities and towns in which the initiation of the SAPS is safer city Cities project has been confirmed. This indicator was initially included in the SAPS's 22-23 annual performance plan, and it has been reviewed following an engagement that we had with our minister and deputy minister to ensure that tangible and sustainable deliverables are associated with the Safer Cities project, and an addendum in this regard will be submitted to the Portfolio Committee on Police through the Office of the Minister. Looking at specialized interventions, um, members, honorable members will be very familiar with these performance indicators. I'm not going to touch on these performance indicators specifically. Identified illegal mining, we have a link to the MTSF 19 to 24. And then we have our crime related hits, as well as our profiled vehicles at land ports, containers at seaports, and cargo consignment at airports. In terms of program three, um, the investigation of crime. Detective services, we have a, a marginal increase in terms of the budget allocation there with the breakdown for the various sub elements of the sub programs being reflected. The detection rates that we have reflected in program three are aligned to the crime categories that we have reflected in program two. And when we look at the uh, detection rates, we will see that the targeted performance is above the estimated performance. However, there has been a decline in terms of our performance for the detection rates over the medium term. Um, the percentage increase in the number of arrests for dealing in illicit drugs, we will maintain that at 5%. The detective service will revise the performance information in relation to that particular performance indicator during the current financial year. Our um, finalizing of the, the various leads, DNA leads, crime, person to crime, crime to crime, fingerprint leads, as well as IBIS, IBIS leads, 
um, honourable members will note the, the increases in the targeted performance versus the estimated performance. In terms of the Criminal Record Centre, we have our three indicators, which members will be familiar with. Um, the percentage of results of trial updated in terms of guilty verdict, not guilty verdict, and conviction reports with the targeted performance indicated. With the forensic laboratory, the percentage of routine case exhibits finalized, the 18.74% estimated performance as at the end of the, the third quarter was impacted on significantly by the backlog that the FSL was dealing with. However, they've elected to maintain the target at 75% within 35 calendar days. And the same principle applies to all of the indicators that, that reside within this particular sub-program. The percentage of case exhibits not yet finalized, the estimated uh, backlog was 119% as at the end of the third quarter, which was a significant improvement compared to the first and second quarters, and the backlog will not exceed 10% in terms of the target. This indicator was added, percentage of DNA case exhibits um, not yet finalized exceeding the prescribed time frame. It's linked to the National Annual Strategic Plan. The um, subprogram specialized investigations, the national head DPCI will deal with these. So I'm going to skip to the program for crime intelligence. The um, program specific budget allocation indicates a marginal increase in the allocation there. Percentage network operations are relatively low estimated performance at the end of 21, 22, which will improve at the end of the financial year and the target 60.85%. Um, just to indicate to honourable members that when you look at the numbers in terms of the targeted performance for 21-22 for all three of these performance indicators, the Division Crime Intelligence has increased their targets for 22-23 as well as the two outer years, 24-25 as well as 23-24 um, and 24-25. The percentage proactive intelligence reports operationalized at district, provincial and national level these targets have been static since the introduction of this, these performance indicators in 2019-20, and the division has elected to improve these targets significantly over the medium term as, as indicated. So where previously we had 70% for um, intelligence reports operationalized at district level, you can see the increase from 75 to 85%. And the same principle would be applicable in terms of the reactive intelligence reports. The percentage cross-border operations, this is in relation to Interpol requests, as well as identified transnational crime suspects, the targets there being 100%. Protection and security services, looking at the two elements, P, uh, PSS as well as PPS, a marginal increase in the budget allocation. Looking at the number of security breaches, we are aware of a security breach that occurred in January that would impact on the second performance indicator, but targeted performance over the medium term, zero security breaches. The strategic installations and national key points also being included for the division protection and security services. PPS, the number of security breaches during physical protection, zero, however, also one security breach um, during uh, January that would impact on the second performance indicator that is relevant to, to Presidential Protection Service, and they will also focus on uh, specific national key points during 22-23. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. That concludes this part of the presentation. With your permission, I will hand over to General Labia. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, General Labia, good morning, um, and you are welcome. Uh, General Labia, you um, may indicate if you're going to do the presentation or if you will hand over to someone else to do it. Good morning, General Labia. You may start. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members. Uh, I'm going to be doing the presentation. Uh, I just want to check if uh, my slide is being shared. Yes, General, uh, you may continue. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Um, is my slide visible, Chairperson? Yes, General, you um, right. are moving. Uh, General, Thank can you see the slide moving? I, I can now see that I have moved oh. to the slide number two. Yes. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, my presentation is a continuation as uh, 
uh, Brigadier Mitchell have indicated. And then uh, let me also uh, greet the Honorable Chairperson and the Honorable Members together with the Deputy Minister, the National Commissioner, and my colleagues. Uh, the presentation is a continuation on Program 3, as uh, indicated by uh, Brigadier Mitchell. Uh, this uh, slide is just an overview of what is contained in the presentation. Uh, we just indicate that uh, it will show clear reporting requirements by the DPCI to Parliament for oversight. Um, the breakdown of performance indicators for 2022 to 2023 and the emerging priorities as well as the DPCI estimated uh, budget. Uh, moving over to the uh, clear reporting requirements, uh, the South African Police Service Act of 1995 was purposefully amended in order to, for the DPCI uh, to be in line with the constitutional court uh, judgment to ensure that uh, the directorate has the necessary structural and operational independent uh, in line with the mandate without undue uh, interference. Uh, Section 17 for H number 4D of the Police Act prescribed that the National Commissioner as the accounting uh, officer of the service shall ensure that the annual reports of the performance of the directorate is included as a separate program in the annual report of the service. Uh, it is a well-considered view of this office that uh, to enable the directory to fulfill its mandate uh, in, in an independent manner, uh, it requires, as required by registration, the feasibility of the directorate being a separate program be entrenched. Uh, in several review bu budget a recommendation, this aspect was uh, uh, hinted. Uh, the performance indicators, uh, it will be noted, uh, Honorable Chairperson, that there are uh, seven that uh, will be reflected in the uh, performance uh, plan. Uh, I will not be reading this, uh, the seven, as they are well known. They cover both the serious organized crime, serious commercial crime, serious corruption investigation, as well as uh, priority crime, specialized uh, investigation. Uh, moving over to the uh, next slide, number seven, uh, is the performance indicators uh, that uh, will will obviously be uh, inclusive of those that I have mentioned. This slide uh, just talk about the uh, additional area where we are monitoring as the DPCI, that is the conviction rates, although they are not coming in the uh, annual uh, performance plan that uh, is presented. This is an area that uh, we measure uh, within the DPCI as it is critical to know as to whether the cases that we are taking through court are successfully uh, prosecuted. So that is the area that uh, we also uh, do the monitoring. Uh, the performance uh, on the uh, indicators that uh, we are reporting on, uh, the first one is the percentage of trial ready case dockets. Uh, the uh, target that has been set there continues to be uh, 70. Uh, we have moved to from uh, 65. Uh, that was the, in the previous uh, financial year. The second one is the percentage of trial ready case dockets of serious corruption within the uh, private sector. Uh, again, all the percentage have been uh, uh, taken to uh, 70 from 65. And then the third one is uh, the percentage of trial ready case dockets for serious corruption within the uh, JCPS. Once more, uh, we were at 65%. We have uh, now moved to uh, 70%. Uh, the next slide 
is dealing with said, um, a serious organized crime. It seems to be moving slow the, the, uh, on the screen. The percentage of uh, registered serious okay. organized crime. My, my apologies, uh, General Nabia. Uh, don't worry about the slides. We also have hard copies. Uh, so uh, continue. They'll catch up with you. Don't worry about them. They'll catch up Thank with you. you. Thanks, General. Thank you, Thank you Honorable uh, Chairperson. Uh, the serious organized crime, uh, we are here dealing with the uh, project. The percentage of registered serious organized crime projects uh, investigation successfully closed. Uh, we were at 72 percent, and then uh, we continue to maintain uh, the target at 72 uh, percent. With regard to the percentage of uh, identified clandestine abort field dismantled with arrest, uh, here the percentage is uh, 90 percent. We continue to maintain uh, the 90 percent as a previous. Uh, indicated in the previous financial year. Uh, the last slide on the uh, uh, performance indicators deals with uh, the trial ready case docket for serious commercial uh, crime. In this regard, uh, the target that has been set is maintained at 65%. The reason being that uh, we have just uh, revisited the mandate so that we elevate from the uh, 100,000 rand to 500,000 rand, which means that uh, the cases will be more complicated as compared to the previous uh, financial year. And then uh, with regard to the uh, percentage of serious cyber-related uh, crime support case for successfully investigated within a, a period of 90 calendar days, uh, here we have uh, maintained 65%. As uh, it will be appreciated that uh, the uh, Cyber uh, Crime Act has just been uh, finalized, and then uh, we are going to be uh, measuring uh, on this aspect. Uh, the area that I said that uh, we are measuring ourselves on, which is uh, the next slide, number 11, is uh, the performance indicators regarding the conviction rate. Uh, in this regard, we are looking at the conviction rate for serious corruption in the private sector, uh, which would be uh, 70%. All of this will be 70% conviction rate for serious uh, corruption in the public sector, as well as the conviction rate for serious corruption in the JCPS. All of this we are measuring on 70%. Uh, percent. Uh, the last one will be the conviction rate uh, in the uh, serious commercial crime. In this one, uh, the percentage is 93%. Uh, so we are maintaining it at 93%. As I've indicated that the case is uh, the amount will now be elevated, which means that uh, we will now be reducing to more uh, serious uh, cases. The next slide will just uh, be talking to the uh, emerging priorities, which will be reflected in slide number 14. Uh, in this regard, having undergone an analysis of the 2021-2022 financial uh, year, the DPCI has identified several priorities for the 2022-2023 financial year. The priorities in this regard uh, include the following. The investigation of the recommendations as set out in the state capture report. This is done through the multidisciplinary approach where the uh, ID within the NPA as well as ourselves and other law enforcement agencies will be uh, focusing on. Uh, the investigation of serious corruption cases linked, uh, linked to the unemployment insurance fund, which was exacerbated by the uh, COVID-19, uh, is also receiving attention and will continue to do that. Uh, we shall also be looking at uh, the uh, tender uh, process 
especially with uh, the personal protective equipment that uh, we are continuing to do that, that was also triggered by the COVID-19. There is also the uh, issue of uh, the state resources that have been um, uh, stolen in other environments, including uh, the municipalities, as it will be reflected below. The threats relating to the pipelines that uh, convey uh, petrol and diesel, the, in those infrastructure that uh, continue to be attacked, that affect the economy of the country, we will be focusing on that. And the investigation uh, relating to the cash and transit robberies that uh, seems to be uh, not subsiding, we will also be focusing on that. There are matters that uh, come from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, reports that are also receiving uh, attention. Uh, as I've indicated, matters relating to the municipalities that have been looted is also receiving attention. There are also crimes against the state, such as the attack on parliament that, uh, and other national key points that uh, will be uh, given attention to. There are still matters that emanate from the July 2021 civil unrest related matters that uh, we are dealing with and then uh, we are also uh, intending to be making more uh, arrest in that regard. There are implementation of uh, the revised refining mandate of the DPCI, as I've indicated, that I will affect the nature of the cases that I will be dealing with. The implementation of the Cyber Crimes Act is one part that I will also require our special attention. We shall, in this regard, ensure that we procure specialized technological aid, the software licenses to deal with cyber-related offenses, and uh, we shall also endeavor to retain personnel through the implementation of Section 17G of the South African Police Service Act. In this regard, I must, I must also hint that uh, we have, in the last financial uh, year, lost 48 of our experienced officials to the greater service due to their promotions. Uh, there are ongoing capacitation of the DPCI in order to ensure that the fixed establishment, as indicated, of 5,332 is attained. I think that uh, the, it has also been indicated by the chairperson that there is a need to support the capacitation of the DPCI through the uh, Office of the National Commission. Suitable and conducive accommodation, as well as accommodation to ensure that uh, there is proper storage of exhibits, also need attention. Uh, the, in the next slide, I will be uh, indicating the uh, estimated budget, which I will not uh, be dealing with that uh, in detail, as the chief financial uh, officer has uh, eloquently dealt with this. All what I can hint is that uh, we have got uh, uh, 2.1 uh, billion rents uh, for this uh, financial year, of which uh, there is uh, this made a portion of 10.48% of uh, the program three allocations. Uh, this is an increase of 4.67 as uh, compared with the previous uh, financial year. The next slide is just a uh, uh, gra uh, graphical uh, show of uh, where we are at com as compared to the rest of program three. Ours is the one in red at the right hand side. And uh, that red one at the right hand side uh, is the one for the DPCI. And I think that the next slide is just about an indication of the uh, expenditure trends. Uh, as well as the estimate for the DPCR. Thank you very much, Chair, Honorable Chairperson, and Honorable Members. I submit. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General Labia. Uh, thank you very much for that detailed presentation. Uh, we appreciate the, the information that you have given us. Uh, needless to say that we will have a session where we can interrogate you, in, not in a negative way, 
but on some of these critical matters that the committee has raised uh, uh, in previous meetings. Um, Deputy National Commissioner, would you like to conclude before I give to the Deputy Minister? Okay. Thanks, uh, Honorable Chairperson. I, uh, I, I think uh, that's the, basically our presentation in terms of tabling of the APP. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, thank you, National Commissioner General Masimola. Uh, Deputy Minister, anything to say before I take the first round of questions? Uh, is the Deputy Minister? Um, I, I think um, the, the Deputy Minister is still on the platform. But, um, yes, yes, Deputy Minister, would you like to conclude before I take the first round of questions? You know, I think we, we, are, we are happy with the presentation, so we can proceed with the questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, DM. Uh, the first hand, I'm taking the first round of hands now. Uh, those members who are leaving early, uh, could I note your hands? Um, and then after the first round, I'll take answers and responses. And then, uh, uh, honorable members, we have until two o'clock today. So you have an opportunity to really interrogate these uh, APPs and budget allocations. Uh, I have, I first had, um, no man, Sheikhi Mam was first. Honorable Sheikhi Mam, you were first, and then Hurnewald, Meshu, and then Ter Blanche in that order. Honorable Sheikhi Mam. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you to the department and congratulations to the new national commissioner. Yes, um, all right, I've got a few questions, Chairperson. First of all, I know it's not directly related to what we're talking about today, but I'd like the national commissioner to comment and the deputy minister that's uh, here on the crisis that we're having in Kimberley at the moment in terms of the trainees. If, if, is there some intervention now to sort out the problem? Because there's been a cry that the conditions are horrific under which they are training them. That's the first thing. Now, my problem is, Chairperson, uh, uh, through you, that uh, the indicators, the performance indicators that the department is talking about, it does not really speak to reality on the ground. And I'm not, this is not entirely as, 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 as the fault of the department itself. You know, we in this country don't take a whole lot of things into consideration, the higher, the increase in the population every year, and the budget allocations are not increasing accordingly. Number two, the high unemployment rates, the number of undocumented foreigners in the country, you know, so the impact of all these things, the, the, the social impact, effect of uh, dysfunctional families and things, which is having a massive uh, 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 impact on the performance of the South African police service. Now, what I personally identified on established chairperson is that the performance is much better and a higher quality at the higher echelons of policing in the country rather than at the lower one. In other words, I'm saying at lower level at the policing, uh, police stations and things, and when you come down in terms of the ranking, this is where we seem to have a massive problem in terms of the quality of services that we are providing. Corruption is rife there. If you saw the successes at the higher like with the Hawks and things recently, I think they're doing a fantastic piece of work and they must be commended, some of the syndicates that they have been breaking down. You know, your 10 triple one, non-existent, just does not work whatsoever. We've raised concern here time and time again about the limited resources where we need to do more with limited resources. That mechanism that we spoke about of monitoring the movement of motor vehicles and officers to track them, it's never happening at station level. As such, the abuse is rife. There is no doubt about that. I mean, it's been picked up time and time again. Then the other problem we got is a lot of your, and again, the fact that at the higher echelons you find success and not at local level, it means there's a problem in terms of the quality of officers. 
It means that the people we are recruiting don't necessarily have the passion for policing, but they coming in, in, in into policing because they need a job. That's what it is all about. Now you're losing a lot of our skilled people. And one of the root causes of it is your system of promotion. Maybe you need to take us into conflicts and tell us what and how much does race play in terms of you promoting police officers? Because time and time again, we're getting complaints from people that have been stuck in one position for 20, 25 years, not even being considered what is the reason for that, that we are not able to, you know, uh, 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 put or point people based on their capacity and the ability to be able uh, uh, to be uh, to perform. Now, the other problem is Jefferson, police officers, one of the most dangerous and riskiest jobs that they do. They are expected to live with criminals in the townships and things. What happened to the system that we had where you used to accommodate them in police quarters? closer to their work so that they're not at risk. You saw what happened during the unrest. Police officers were not even able to come to work. And you can see the number of them that are losing their lives being attacked by criminals because they have to go back to that community where criminals arrive on a daily basis. Nothing is actually happening. You know, we speak about support system. You know, a police officer, if he's not happy at home, if he is not well, means he's not going to be able to perform. Chairperson, you know, thanks to the provincial commissioner in the Western Cape, every time you call him, he intervenes immediately. You know, there was a, a, a couple that were working in a station that were fighting both officers. They were going to almost kill themselves. And time and time, nothing was being done until the provincial commissioner intervened. Thanks, good. That matter is now resolved. So that wellness program that we're talking about is not effective. The, 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 the uh, you know, lifestyle audits on police officers. And I think it needs to be enhanced at a local level. We need to look at that because it's really not. But I think what I'm saying is just that the quality of services is not speaking to the expenditure. And that is because I think too much of emphasis is on giving us these performance indicators rather than being practical on the ground and seeing what are our challenges. If you remember, we've, we've highlighted, I think Chair, it was before your time as the chair, to do a, some research on to crime in a particular area by certain detectives. Are these detectives stationed in a particular police station or precinct, investigating the same suspects or criminals and what is the success rate, success rate or withdrawal to see whether there's a pattern in terms of collusion and corruption. What happened to the rotational system where police officers should not be stuck in one police station for a long period of time? So I think these are just some of the things that I wanted to highlight, that the police services have got a difficult task. You know, you've got development taking place. They are not consulted whatsoever. They are expected to provide the services. They are pro expected to prevent crime, but they're also expected to deal with crime after that. And it's making it very, very difficult. Uh, I want to again know, are you really sitting with the other, uh, in the criminal justice system, with the correctional facilities, with the court, the justice system? Because time and time again, police officers are complaining. We're making the arrest. Two hours later, the people are out on bail. Cases are being thrown out. They don't know what to do. I'll stop there for now, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Sheikh Imam. Uh, next is Honorable Khunawa. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Chair, firstly, allow me also to congratulate uh, General Masimola on his uh, appointment as a new commissioner. I wish him well. And I must say that uh, what I've seen about his priorities, um, it's the correct analysis. And the priorities are the priorities that should be priorities. So I wish him well with that, but my question, Honorable Chair, is to the uh, Commissioner. Um, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, it's a word, but uh, he's only having two years before he uh, reached the age of 60, and in terms of the Police Act, then uh, he cannot continue. Uh, except, of course, if there is uh, a resolution taken from the National Assembly to extend it for another two years, does he foresee that he will obtain these priorities and the objectives 
within two years? That's that's my first question. Chairperson, my next question is, and I've raised this matter uh, previously, it's about the compensation, and I want to put it very clearly. I don't say that our members of the police service should not receive well-paid salaries, but the compensation is 78,3% of the budget. Now, that's far too high. I mean, we have a budget of almost 100 billion, but 78% is only for salaries. Uh, so what we are actually saying is that we have about 20 billion for operational issues. And Chairperson, I've asked before, what steps will be taken to reduce the percentage of the compensation as far as the budget is concerned? So I'm asking it again. And with that, uh, Chairperson, we know that there are new recruits, uh, members, uh, the president said 12,000. May I ask how many has been uh, recruited? How many new members that as far as those 12,000 is concerned is at this moment uh, under training? And mentioned that there was in the newspapers about the very, very poor living conditions of the new recruits at Kimberley where they didn't even have proper places to sleep, where women had to share with men uh, the same facilities and everything. So I'd like to have an update on that. Uh, further, my next question, it's also the welfare of our members. Uh, we have the Subs Educational Trust and Chairperson, uh, it has been raised before, and we know that Firstly, I want an explanation of the significant decrease in the number of applications received for 2022. Uh, it seems there were only 20 applications. Um, and I also want to know whether the outstanding 203 bursaries for 2020 academic year had been paid. And I also want to know uh, whether these bursaries, do they cover primary, secondary, and tertiary education? And if so, can we get a breakdown on that? Chairperson, we sympathize when our members are killed. This fund is specifically for their relatives when a member has been killed. It is most important because the family and the welfare is dependent on these bursaries to at least ensure that they have a proper education. So I would like to get the answers on that. Chairperson, when it comes to visible, uh, visible policing, I want to ask as far as the Centre of Firearms Registry is concerned. We received presentations from CETA and everything, and they then said it will be more or less a, a week, and everything will be 100% working as far as the registration of the firearms on the system. My information is it is not online. It is not working. And I want to clarify this matter. And then I want to ask, why can't we allow provincial CFRs to also approve or disapprove certain licenses and do the process? Honorable Chair, I am flooded, and I say flooded, with members of the public, firearms owners, waiting for their firearm licenses. Uh, they bought new firearms, still waiting, has been approved, but they don't get the license card itself. I myself waited for more than a year, and I say more than a year, before I received approval for my renewal of my firearm. So, Chairperson, I want to have clarity on that issue. As far as the DNA tests are concerned, uh, the forensics, Chairperson, we had long discussions on this meeting. As far as FDA is concerned, the previous provider, and 
I can remember that I said at that one stage that, well, what about the outstanding matters about court cases? I've also asked, what is the situation with those samples that FDA withheld because they were not paid? Now, my question is very clearly, what happened with those samples? My information is that FDA is on its way to court. It's going to cost us money, and the samples will not be released before the case has been completed. And I want an update on that, please, to know exactly what is going on there uh, and what preventative steps uh, will be taken to ensure that those samples uh, will be released. And Chairperson, in the end, uh, the samples will be of such a nature that it will not stand a court case. And then, because of this, there will be victims of crime that will not have and receive justice because of this. So I'd like to have very clear answers on that, the Chairperson. Lastly, Chairperson, unfortunately, you didn't say how many questions we may ask, but I'm going to ask as far as DPCI is concerned. Again, I asked the question, can I just get an update uh, on so, the... Uh, my apologies, Honorable Groenewald. I'm taking as many questions. Remember, I shortened the presentations. So um, I'll take your responses because you're leaving at uh, half past 12. So ask your questions so that they can give you responses. Thank, uh, thank you. And, you and Shaky Mum and Meshu, you requested to leave early. So after Honorable Siabi, I'll take the responses. So please ask your questions. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, my last question is about the DPCI. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, firstly, uh, can I get an update? Because I've also raised the matter. Uh, on the age of uh, the national head, and I say again, I don't want to get rid of uh, General Sibia, uh, but I think he wants uh, to know and have certainty in his position uh, so that he can do his work. Uh, I am not aware that National Assembly approved a further two years, so can I have an update on that, uh, please? And then can I have more specifics on... Uh, the priorities as far as the crimes against the state, the arson that took place at Parliament. Where are we now? Uh, uh, is uh, the accused, uh, is there going to be a further court case? How long are we going to wait for further uh, investigations to be completed? So we have, would like to have an update that, on that. And also an update on the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and the cases. How many cases are at the DPCI and how many had been finalized? Thank you, Honorable Chair, and I highly appreciate the opportunity to ask all my questions. Well, there are many other questions, but I think those are the most important from my side. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Khurnaval. Honorable Meshu. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I also want to join my colleagues and start by congratulating General Masamula on his appointment. We trust that the two years he has will change the image of the police. That is unfortunately not pleasant to hear from the people. And one of the unfortunate things that happened the past few days was to hear individuals, um, companies, and also I had one political party that has contributed to the KZN floods victims saying, we don't trust government. So we rather give our donations to the gift of the givers because we can't trust our government. And obviously, it is not only people who are looking at government as a whole, but you also hear people say, we don't trust the police. 
Now, I would want to know, particularly for the new uh, National Commission, General is aware of the reputation that the police have. Besides the issue of police being accused of corruption and police being seen to participate uh, in matters of corruption, including police who allow their service pistols to be used by people who should not be using them. What is the general hoping to do to change this perception or reality that people are having regarding the image of the police? We see an increase in the number of private security companies. And more people are now turning towards these private security companies because they say they don't trust the police. You call the police during an emergency, some of them come after two hours. Now, there are even those who are alleging that the police who have interests and who have shares in police security companies, in private security companies, uh, are deliberately ensuring that crime is not brought under control in the area so that these private companies can do the work for the police. Otherwise, if they get crime under control, then these private security companies might be out of work. So this perception has to change. Members of the public must trust the police. Now you have 10 triple one that is given to individuals, that is publicized. If you have an emergency called 10 triple one, one of my colleagues raised the issue of 10 triple one. Uh, Chairperson, it is not an exaggeration to say sometimes you can think that this 10 triple one is useless because you have, on a number of occasions, people calling 10 triple one and the number is unanswered. What is being done to ensure that 10 triple one gives people an assurance that if I call this number, I'm going to receive help because if it's not attended, even when you call, they say, you, the person will say, we are short of, of vents, we cannot come now, or we will come, and then it takes three hours before they respond. Um, it is frustrating, Chairperson. Now, um, obviously there are a number of experienced personnel that leaves the service, and some of them are happy to leave because of the conditions of service. Some of them are happy to leave, particularly those who are anti-corruption. When they see their colleagues being involved in corruption and getting away with it. So this demoralizes those who want to do their job. There are a number of good police men and women that we salute because they are doing an excellent job. But when such people see their colleagues who do wrong and they get away with it, and an opportunity come to leave the service, they leave, they grab with both hands. Why? Because it demoralizes them to see people getting away, corrupt police being retained, demoralizes them. Um, General Sibia, I think, uh, did refer to uh, July 2021 civil unrest related cases. We, there is a concern on the ground that while the country was told that we know who, who started this, we know who's behind this, there are no serious convictions. Now, I'd like the general to elaborate on this. Uh, July 2021 civil unrest related cases. What is happening with these cases? Because we don't see convictions, particularly uh, among the people who are politically in, in public. They are known, they are known, and people are saying the police know that so and so is involved, and yet nothing's happening. Why? And my last question has to do with the prosecution of high profile individuals 
particularly politicians. The, whether it is a perception or whether it is reality, the fact is it is the most cases juniors in departments who are being arrested and prosecuted. But the people who are known, the, the high profile politicians, some of them more than almost five years, their cases have been in the public space for five years. And until today, nothing's happening. So I want to know whether the hawks are scared of some of these politicians, or why are they dragging their heels or their feet? Because when it comes to ordinary uh, politicians or ordinary officials, they seem to be happy to pounce on them. But if it's politicians, they don't pounce on them. What could be the reason? And when are we going to start seeing the heads roll among known leading politicians? Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Meshu. Honorable Tablanche. Uh, Chairperson, thank you. Um, Chairperson, let me also start by congratulating the new National Commissioner. Um, I didn't see him this morning. He didn't put up his picture, and I was just wondering whether he's got his uniform sorted. Now it's just a joke. I know that they had the, a little function where the ranks were changed. Chairperson, yeah, um, I have, and I think we need to give the new National Commissioner a proper opportunity to, you know, just get settled in and start doing things. But he took, the baton was passed to him, and obviously he needs to take responsibility, you know, even for the past, unfortunately, because he needs to do something about it. Chairperson, I went through the presentation and I was quite impressed. That is something that the police can really do very well. They are very, very good in compiling very good presentations. And I think that section needs to be commended for that. It is a very, very good presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, there on page three of that presentation, there are so many strategies and plans. And I was just wondering to what extent all that strategies uh, got implemented and what is the impact on that? Um, Chairperson, also a lot of proposed plans and the very same question that I have, what is happening about that plans? Are they implemented yet? And once again, if implemented, what is the outcome and what is the, what, what changes did that uh, bring about? Chairperson mentioned is also making that presentation about a court case that the police won against the gun owners. And, but then obviously, Chairperson, the question then is, what happened now regarding the concerns of that people? We know that uh, the situation at the Central Firearm Register is really, really very concerning. My colleagues member uh, raised already a lot of issues there. Chairperson, flooded is not the word, you know, that is one of the major things that we need to do as politicians is to respond to questions being asked about firearms and what else. And really, we have spent hours and hours and we visited the place. And quite frankly, uh, the situation hasn't changed a lot. Jefferson, you know, um, while I'm dealing with the plans, you know, we have wonderful plans, as I said. But if you visit police stations, it is very, very clear that there is no impact or very little impact on the ground. If you go to some police stations, it is very worrying to see the level of expertise that these people still have. You know, they don't know the legislation of this country. They can't help you. And quite often, they are just not available. Even if you phone even to districts, to station commanders, and even some provinces. It is impossible, and I complained about this many a time in, future, in the past already. You can't manage to get hold of somebody that is able to, to answer your question or to respond to something on what you want to ask. 
you know, I, I want to uh, raise something, you know, I want to, to, to mention the phrase that the uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was famous for, his dream speech. And, it, and, and I also have a dream. I have a dream that all these plans are going to be implemented and that some change will be seen quite evidently that people will see a difference uh, that we all of us are yearning for. Uh, chairperson, getting to the budget, it is quite um, interesting to see that, you know, in terms of visible policing, there is only 1% increase and all the other stuff. And, you know, it's quite, uh, it was also obvious that uh, the, you know, VIP protection services, they got a better increase than visible policing. Um, you know, contact crimes must uh, decrease by 50% at some stage, and I really don't see we are moving fast in that direction. Chairperson also complained that we receive from the public is Apparently, in some areas, the drug lords are known to the police. And the question is, why uh, do the police not act against these people? Um, Chairperson, then, if you, you know, the detectives, there is a decrease in their, you know, to solve the, the investigations that they are being dealt with, that they are dealing with. Um, and then, Chairperson, you know, if you, there was an inspection done by the MEC for safety and security in KZN. And about all the police station or the major part of that was found to be um, dysfunctional. Because for two main reasons. The one is the, the appalling conditions, infrastructure wise, and then also lack of vehicles and all other stuff. And chairperson, I asked a question at the time about this and I got a response from the police indicating that they haven't received that uh, report yet. So my question here on this platform now is that they receive that uh, report from the MEC's office. And if yes, what is the position and what have they done about that? Chairperson, it was also raised already by my colleagues that we got a lot of complaints about people in training facilities that is not that is not conducive to training at all. The one in the Northern Cape that was raised, apparently they get Whitbix without milk and sugar for breakfast, and there's no medical facilities. It is just an appalling condition, and I just want to get feedback on that, uh, that again and also regarding the others. Chairperson, getting to getting to the uh, to General Libya's section, and my colleagues also touched on that extensively. Chairperson, there is an outcry from the public saying we don't see that this big criminals or well-known criminals, well-connected criminals, politicians that action are being taken against them. In certain provinces, there is a well-known, um, let's call it an alleged criminal, and the case is uh, under investigation by um, General Labia's people, and nothing is happening. This man is still going on with all these things. He's very visible, he's very vocal, and there is a perception that nothing is happening. Chairperson, then lastly, uh, apparently we managed to complete two police stations. Can I say it again? Two police stations we were able to finalize in the last financial year. And Chairperson, there's an outcry that policing must be brought nearer to the people. And if this is the case, we'll never be able to get there. Um, Chairperson, for now, I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Te Blanche, Honorable Shembeni, um, and then it's the Honorable Majosi, 
Uh, Khurnavalt will come in before you, so don't feel uh, uh, as if I'm undermining you. Uh, Shembeni, Siabe, Khurnavalt, and then Majosi. Thank you, Chairperson, uh, and good morning to the Deputy Minister. Uh, and congratulations once again to the newly appointed National Commissioner General Masrimula. And then good morning to the staff, uh, the generals present, uh, and uh, other members of the South African Police and the honorable members. Uh, I will start by asking a question as to how far is the SAPS with the recruiting and the training of the 12,000 new police personnel? While we are still there, General Masimula, there is a big question because I've been receiving <laughs> telephone calls from uh, a number of uh, members or ever uh, students questioning about corruption. that they've done assessments and all these things, but at the end of the day, when it comes to being called, they are not called. You are not told whether you have failed your assessment or your medical assessment or whatever. Nothing comes after that. Quiet. And you just hear a friend that I'm going on this date. What is happening there? Can please the general look at this recruitment, whatever, panels, as to what is happening there. Nepotism seems to be at a high rate. People are crying that uh, our senior management kids or families and staff are the ones that are being recognized, are the ones that are being enlisted to go to the colleges. What is happening? Secondly, that one of the reservists, I thought that you have done that one and we went through on that one in an amicable way. But to me, it comes back, we are still getting calls that people are being left out. People, they did their assessments. They went for the medical examinations and the like, but they don't get the responses from the SAPS as to what is happening. Can the South African police just deal with this thing of the reservists and get through it? And it must be done and dusted. And secondly, my appeal, I don't know, it's my suggestion. If we can just do away with the thing of the reservists, that can help us a lot. Because as the South African police service, we are having reservists, but we cannot control them. We don't know how are the reservists working. Reservist, a reservist, it's working certain hours in a month or a week, or to say a month, say it's 48 hours in a month or 45. But our reservists today are working 24 hours a day. Why? That tells you that something is wrong somewhere. And how can you find a reservist in a state rightly alone? or two of them alone, under whose control are they? Because a reservist is not a police officer. But we find these people now doing police duties alone, under no supervision. That is not how it's supposed to be. So it's either we do our way with the reservist and employ people that are going to work as police officers. Secondly, a police officer must be screened. It's not a matter of that this SAPS must just recruit people for the sake of unemployment. No, it can't be. Police officers are being screened. You don't just take a criminal from the street and enlist that criminal to become a police officer because he or she is not working for the sake of employment. No. As far as I remember, policing... It's a calling, but today it's no longer a calling. It's where uh, people are, it's a playground. 
the South African police service is a playground of criminals and all these things. We are a superior department in all those departments who must lead by example, but we are failing to lead. That's where criminals are stored. Secondly, of specific interest in the research that will be conducted over the short term to determine the extent to which the SAPS is executing its constitutional mandate. The minister should indicate what informed the decision to conduct this research and what is the expected outcome of the research. For instance, if the research concludes that the SAPS is not fulfilling its constitutional mandate, what will follow such finding? Thirdly, a short-term priority uh, is the reinstatement of the SAPS fitness program. When and why was this program stopped? How does the SAPS currently ensure the fitness of operational members? It's a very big question. You go outside in the streets there of Cape Town, you will see a police officer or a police woman uh, with a very big tummy walking on the streets there with the boots unfastened without the firearm and all these things. What is that? If there anything like uh, backslashers or whatsoever, these things just happen in front of them and nothing is happening. And what type of police officers are these ones? I think this fitness test issue, this program is very, very much important. These things have been done uh, in the olden days to keep our police officers fit in order to be able to run after the criminals and so on. There are places where you need to run. There are places where you need to shoot. But in most cases, it's the running and the apprehending of the suspects that must be done. This is the most important one. What is the current status of and the capacity of our SAPS garages? What is the average time that the vehicles spend in the garages? How many vehicles are currently in SAPK garages and that's not operational for policing? I think I've once asked this question where we had Houting having more than 1,168 or 58 vehicles in the garage or in garages, stationary, not operational, because of services and some other things. We might find that other one needs a, a battery. The other one is the bricks. These are things that need to be fitted. These are not mechanical issues. It's a remove and a replace, and the car must go out and work. But we are failing to do such small things. Reason being, our state garages have been turned private garages, whereby our managers, those people that are managing the state garages, have turned them into their own. They are doing private work there using our state money to buy parts to repair private cars. And we're doing nothing about that. And there is no inspection. I heard you are talking about inspectorate and what, 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 but I'll come to that. What are they doing? Because these are the people who are supposed to do uh, unannounced visits into those garages to see what is happening there. Because you must go there this week and go after two weeks. You mark, you just mark the cars. You have got your diary, you write these things. 
when you come back, you ask, this car was here. The past three weeks, what is happening with this car? Can the department provide details on what resourcing is, a request, is required at the top five provinces and top 30 police stations to reduce violent crimes? What is needed? We need to hear from the department what is needed. Is it the personnel? What, 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 what is it? If not the personnel, what, what type of resources are needed there to help those stations? <laughs> Remember, I once said that it is uh, of most important imperative that those uh, commanders from those stations, they come and sit with us here so as to tell us exactly what problems are they facing from their stations. Because I know exactly what is happening in the SAPS. You report that this and that it's not correct here, then you become a victim. And what I'm saying is true. You know it all day. Person. Also, you have the same problem. Honorable Shimbeni, uh, I've lost you. Is he still on the platform or has he been kicked out? His network was very bad. I will come back to him. Uh, Honorable Siabi, can you come in and then I'll give Shimbeni another opportunity? Uh, Siabi? Thank you, Chair, and let me greet all honorable members on the platform, the Deputy Minister, the National Commissioner, and his delegation. Honorable Chair, I'm going to request that uh, I switch off my video. Where I am, I have a serious challenge of network. I've been struggling since this morning. If you agree, Chair. Agreed, Honorable Whip. Um, as long as we have your voice, uh, we are Thank very you. happy. Thank you, Chair. And let me join my colleagues in welcoming the presentations, both, pre both from the CFO and, the, and for the APP, and also from uh, General Libya, uh, CFO, General Michel, and General Libya. It is a well-structured presentation. And if we were to live by the spirit of the presentation, we really go somewhere. Chair, I see in the priorities of the National Commissioner, when he was uh, appointed, one of his priorities is uh, making sure that he fills, he fills the vacant positions, especially in crime intelligence, especially the head 
of crime intelligence, if we can be briefed of progress with that regard. Secondly, what we'd like to know, the status of the organizational restructuring process. At some stage, we were briefed that uh, the organization is undergoing organizational restructuring. How far is the process? Because from the APP and the budget estimates, one is unable to extract the status of organizational structure. <clears throat> Chair, wasteful and fruitless unauthorized expenditure, my understanding is that should form part of uh, the performance contract of the National Commissioner and the direct reports to the National Commissioner. But I don't see emphasis on doing away with underspending. Because underspending has been a thorn in our flesh as a committee, chairperson and honorable members, if you may recall. And a lot of money has to be returned back due to underspending. Yes, there was a reason of COVID, but we were not satisfied with that reasoning. As a, because the, the money was supposed to be spent. There is underspending or no spending on issues of crime intelligence, and we ended up experiencing the KZN and Houting unrest in July last year. Underspending on issue or no spending on issues of forensic life science laboratory, central firearm. Uh, registry, there is a, a lot of underspending. Now, in the APP, I don't see a plan to deal with underspending. Maybe we can be briefed on that. At the same time, I don't see the plan or the ICT plan in the, maybe it is there, I might have missed it, missed it. Because you remember that uh, during the South African Human Rights Commission's hearing into 2021 civil unrest, one of the issues raised was the non-synchronization of radios. But at the same time, I see that target on the implementation of digital radio communication site being removed from the APP. Uh, maybe it's replaced by something. I, I may not have paid attention, but one would need assistance in that regard. And at the same time, in a number of previous committee meetings, the deputy minister especially always referred to legislative provision that uh, will allow SAPS to opt out of CETA arrangement because CETA has been disappointing us a lot. Now, if we can uh, get clarity on that one, because from the, the APP, one does not uh, see that coming out, 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 out clear. As I move towards the end of my question, Chair, um, can the SAPs indicate what proportion of stolen or illegal firearms recovered are unidentifiable? Uh, thus, if they are without serial numbers. And is uh, SAPs confident? that the three performance indicators related to firearms are adequate to improve the regulation of firearms in South Africa, because there are only three performance indicators related to this. Do they think they are, they are adequate to improve the regulation of firearms in, um, in South Africa? Maybe for now, Chair, let me pause here. I'll come again later. Thank you.
thank you very much, Honorable Siabe. Uh, Honorable Groenewald and then uh, Honorable Meshu wants to come in again. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, my apologies. Uh, just another question what I wanted to ask is, can we get an update on the air? Uh, Sorry, Chair. Sorry, can I continue? Yes, you may. Could you please uh, mute your mics? Thank you, Chair. Can, can we get an update on, on the air wing uh, in the subs? Because uh, my information is that with the, the disaster in KZN, Durban only had one helicopter available. And in Bloemfontein, there are three helicopters, but only one is operational. Uh, we see again, when we have a disaster, when we need the equipment, it seems we don't have it. So if I can just get an update on the number of operational uh, aircraft uh, in the sub. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Before I, um, uh, it's Honorable Meshu, and then I will read Honorable Majosi's input on uh, the chat group. Honorable Siabi, Honorable Whip, please mute your mic. Uh, Honorable Meshu, you can start now. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. My question Chair has Chair to Chair do Chair Honorable Shembedi, just mute your mic. I will give you another chance. All right, uh, Chair Chairperson, my question has to do with the securing of police, including their lives, because we know that there are some police stations that have uh, security companies or security personnel. Um, during last year's um, July uh, uh, riots, uh, we saw some police begging and retreating, retreating from groups of people that were confronting them. And in some cases, one would hear the mobs shouting at them, shoot us, shoot us. And so after things come down, I asked some of the officers questions. Why didn't you respond? when they were challenging you openly, even saying, shoot at us, shoot at us. And some of them said, they are using the same public transport, the buses and the trains, that these people who are shouting at them and, and challenging them are using. So they are scared. Now, how do police do their work when they are scared? There is a fear factor amongst the police. And one of them even said, if you shoot, then you are on your own. The seniors are going to distance themselves. They will not even listen to your story. And um, obviously, when there are such perceptions, again, among the police, that if you do something wrong, if you try and defend yourself, and then you are told or you think you are going to be on your own because your seniors are going to distance themselves, how can we expect them to bring, how can we expect the police, the ground forces, to bring crime under control? And my last question is, why is killing of a policeman not classified as a crime against the state? As we know that national key points, anybody who does something to them uh, is guilty of uh, committing a crime against the state. So why is the killing of police officers who want to do their job and protect citizens um, be treated just as a case of murder when they're killed, when they could be, uh, their murderers could be char charged for killing uh, or yeah, committing a crime against the state. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, uh, thank you, Honorable Meshu. Um, and now, Honorable Shimbeni, you wanted to come in again? Yes, sir. I was not finished. No, Honorable Shimbeni, your, 
first letter of uh, this. Uh, honorable Shilbeni, uh, Honorable yes. Shilbeni, your network was bad and then you were out of the meeting. And now again, your network is bad. Can you try again, please? Chairperson, maybe she should switch off the video. That might help. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Uh, please try again, Honorable Shimbeni. Can you hear me now? Yes, try. You can try. We'll let you know. Okay. Uh, let me be, be very quick. I said, what is the current state of the training academies in the SAPS? in terms of infrastructure and trainees or trainers. And then it is reported that the SAPS has got 314 trainers available across all training facilities. And now the question is, are they enough? If not, what is happening? Another one is that the department should present its 2022 training schedule model to the committee so that the community, uh, so that the community can find out if the model is implementable. What is the status of the organizational restructuring process? According to the Safety and Security Sectoral Bargaining Council, the Triple SBC Agreement of uh, one of 2020, the restructuring must be completed by 2023-2024. The next one is the SAP included a performance indicator to increase compliance with the taking of buccal samples from Schedule 8 arrested offenders. The 2022-2023 target is to bring compliance to 75%. However, the 2020 proclamation by the President compels the SAPS to take buccal samples from all Schedule 8 offenders. Why is the target set lower than 100%? Lastly, when was the last security audit and evaluation uh, concluded in Parliament? as a national two-point complex. If there was any, what were the findings and what were the recommendations? I thank you, sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, President. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Shembeni. Uh, don't worry, we are busy to o'clock, so I'll give you enough time. Don't even feel that uh, stress is not going to get enough time. Um, Honorable Anyone here? Who's here now again? I'm coming to you. Reverend Meshu, today you are out of order. Eh? I said I'm going to read my jersey and then I will bring to you Honorable Meshu. Chairperson, um, she has to leave the meeting. It's my Josie. Um, she wants feedback regarding the matter she has raised of police who send them com complaints. Um, uh, these complaints, National Commissioner, I think we need to work out some system where uh, matters of complaints were sent to the previous National Commissioner uh, so that they do not fall through the cracks and uh, so that those uh, matters of emphasis and uh, uh, the, the complaints and inquiries which members sent to the former National Commissioner so that those uh, matters are attended to. I'll ask Honorable Majorzi to send this and give more details to Nicolette, and then we'll be in touch with the National Commissioner's Office 
uh, Deputy Minister will discuss that with you so that we have a smooth handover from the former commissioner's office to the uh, current commissioner's office. Uh, Honorable Meshu, you have the floor. Chairperson, my hand is not up. All right, thank you very much. So that was, I'm not gonna say old end because you're still young. I'll say these were historical ends. Honorable Siabi, do you have a historical end? All right, that was also a historical end. Um, could we then now start with the Deputy Minister? A uh, Deputy Minister, don't ask me to uh, indicate the speakers. Uh, we'll give you and the National Commissioner an opportunity, and then you will, National Commissioner, will indicate the uh, generals or uh, the Deputy National Commissioners who will respond to questions. Uh, I hand to the, um, the Deputy Minister and then the National Commissioner, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to honorable members on the questions that uh, uh, they, they have raised. I, I will talk to uh, the issue that was uh, raised. I think it's uh, honorable uh, uh, Blanche, uh, no, no, Honorable Kunevald about uh, the head of the Hawks. Uh, the, the ministry is seized with that, uh, that matter. We, we have had a, a discussion with the legal opinion that we, we were given, generated from within the civilian secretariat. And uh, we also went out to get an external opinion. But there were two conflicting opinions uh, that were generated from the civilian secretariat and that we were not happy with uh, that outcome because uh, it was not appropriate. But we are still grappling with, with that. And we, were, we, we had taken a decision that uh, the chair of the committee should be updated in terms of what we, we are doing on the matter because she has formally communicated on, on this matter. But it's an issue that uh, we have not yet concluded. As soon as the, uh, we conclude uh, the internal processes we are dealing with, we will then report to, to the committee on uh, how the matter should be processed uh, uh, going forward. It's a matter that uh, we have prioritized. It's a matter that uh, we think it should be cleared so that uh, they're, they're, we all move together uh, as one. It is not good as well for the head of uh, the, the hopes to be operating in an environment where there are issues raised around uh, uh, he's being head of the, the institution. So it's an urgent matter and we are prioritizing it to ensure that uh, we bring it to finality. We'll come back to you, Chair, and the, and the committee as soon as uh, the matter is concluded with the internal processes. And I will request that uh, the other uh, issues that were raised, we allow uh, General Masemula and the team uh, uh, including the head of the Hawks, to, to talk to those issues. Over to you, General Masemula, if you may allow through you, Chairperson. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. Uh, General Masemula, before you, you start, if you could just respond to five matters, and before the end of the month, give me an absolute positive response in terms of progress on the following five matters. The first one was mentioned by the Deputy Minister. Next week, I'll put the matter of the, um, the head of the DPCI on, on the parliamentary agenda. Uh, sorry, sorry, honorable members, that is my alarm going off because my electricity is coming back on. Uh, so, could I have uh, on the agenda 
the appointment and the approval then of the extension of the DPCI heads a, a, a contract and that it is done legally and above board. Could Nicolette, we ask that the parliamentary legal team assist me with that so that that presentation appears before us next week. I'm not giving you longer time. I have given you sufficient time and uh, uh, the deadline is next week. The second deadline, Honorable Deputy Minister and National Commissioner, you all know that I come from Kimberley. You gave me a very miserable Easter gift by placing a whole lot of recruits in Kimberley and uh, not giving paying good attention to their well-being and welfare. Um, I had so many complaints uh, over the Easter weekend that I actually ran away. Uh, could we please, during this week, it's Wednesday today, General Reed, General Vuma, all the Deputy National Commissioners, please sort out Kimberley. I am not going to have my Premier and my Ministers calling me day in and day night out. DM, it's a nightmare if your Premier calls you and says you're the chair of the committee, but you're doing nothing. It's a huge embarrassment for me as the chairperson of the committee that people are based in Kimberley and uh, they are not well, well treated and um, they are in the local newspapers complaining about their conditions, uh, where they are, are sleeping, where they are accommodated and the food that they are eating their living conditions just terrible and unacceptable, and I am not going to respond to this any further. So the first one is General Labia, the head of DPCI. The second one is sort out Kimberley for me urgently. The third one is can I have a, a head for crime intelligence? I'm going to give you cutoff dates for that. That's three, four. Can you sort out the forensic science laboratories there? I will give you a list that has to be done immediately. Five, the Central Firearm Registry. Deputy Minister, I'll speak to the minister. If it means we must give another uh, uh, amnesty. We have more than 500,000 people with illegal firearms. Now, if 500,000 people are requesting uh, firearm licenses, then you can imagine how many phone calls and emails. I'm repeating this several times. If you do not have a plan, you came, you brought CETA. He said that by the end of that week, the Friday, the board of CETA would sit and the, uh, the matter of the Central Firearm Registry would be sorted out. They would go online. I am really going to call that ahead of CETA back to this committee because he is really, he is misleading this committee. And I'm going to take further steps on anybody who comes to this committee and misleads us. Those are the five areas, National Commissioner, if you can start your appointment, they, they speak about your first 100 days. So if in the next two weeks, you can give us a briefing on what is happening. Kimberly, you don't even have a week. Please sort this out. President spoke about crime intelligence not having a head. We are not even going to speak about that fund of crime intelligence. Again, you come back to me and say you haven't spent that money. So, General, you are inheriting a hornet's nest. General Massimola, you are inheriting all our problems. We have run out of time. We wish you well because we know that a number of these problems you are going to be inheriting, but we have all the confidence that with the team you have, you'll be able to attend to these matters. Uh, National Commissioner, uh, you may take the floor and then you may indicate which uh, of, uh, members of your team would be responding to which questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson and uh, members and uh, the Deputy Minister.
thanks. I take note of the five priorities that you gave, Honorable Chair, and uh, we will, with the team, engage in delivering in that regard. Uh, going back to the questions, Honorable Chair, yes, Kimberly has been keeping us all of us awake. Uh, General Guma and uh, the Divisional Commission of Training, General Zulu, they will respond on that. I know they've been engaged uh, over the long weekend in Cuba. Uh, we will get a report from them regarding the, the Cuba matter. Uh, on the matters raised by uh, Honorable Sheikh Imam about the practicality of key performance indicators. Yeah, I think uh, as we develop a new uh, APP, we will engage quite a number of stakeholders, including external stakeholders, including also the portfolio committee, while developing the APP, not only engage at the end when we are uh, we are tabling, but engage long before we get to uh, where we still develop it. Uh, on the matter of, uh, there was a question raised around why provinces can uh, can't approve a farm license. I think it was by Dr. Kunewald. Uh, the provinces currently they do approve farm licenses, but only in terms of renewal. That is your section 18 uh, farm licenses, your self defense. That renewal is not done, it is done in the provinces. But the new section 18, yes, they come to uh, the head office. Uh, there was a question around the matters of the image of the police uh, by Honorable Mishwe. Uh, well, in terms of uh, improving the morale and image of police, that's the objective of the team currently that we are going to uh, take our hands and keep ourselves with regard to that, including, of course, the resuscitation of your fitness programs, which uh, uh, you remember we had those programs two years ago, and when uh, COVID set in, uh, everything was taken back and we never pushed it forward. But we are in the process of resuscitating that and make sure that there are fitness programs and also uh, push measures that we started in terms of looking at where can our members train, which areas can we uh, find to have police members train there. But also, uh, in terms of uh, improving our morale, we are looking at programs with the EHW as to uh, how can we improve the morale. And of course, uh, it also linked up with the question that was raised that uh, our police members are afraid uh, of uh, taking action. Uh, with regard to that one, uh, we, we are aware that police members are trained in terms of the use of their firearms, the circumstances under which they can use firearms. And where members use firearms uh, in terms of the prescribed legislation, uh, management do not at all uh, don't give them alone at their own. They get supported both in terms of uh, in their subsequent court cases. They get support in terms of uh, during the litigation in terms of legal fees and so on. So they don't get left to their own. It's only where members transgress where uh, they, uh, they 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 uh, will have to face the consequences. Uh, in terms of, uh, there was a question in terms of the report of the MEC of Kwasi Natal. I made inquiries. The province have not yet received that. 
support, but uh, we do take note of what was raised, uh, which we learned through the media that police stations conditions are appalling and vehicles are not uh, serviced. Uh, we embarked on the decentralization of police garages this year from uh, 1st of April. The garages will no more be controlled at national level, but uh, in the provinces, is a process that we are busy with now, and we think that will, if the provincial commissioners are responsible for their garages, that will uh, improve the service because they will be able to manage the garages directly. The general read and general will talk more on that, but uh, that's the process that we have uh, started. And I also mentioned that we need to look at, we are busy now to look at how can we enhance the service to go more over to a 24-hour service, because we are working 24 hours as a police service. Now, if the garage only works during the day, uh, actually that is, 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 a, is a problem. If we can improve the service, that certain things can be done overnight, and uh, some repairs and minor services can be done overnight, that will reduce a number of vehicles that are found in our police garages, because some of them, they are there for minor uh, things at all. Uh, the question of uh, how many enlistment we have, the HR will respond to that. And, uh, yeah, the, also the turnaround, they will talk to that one. There was a question around uh, the top 30 conduct crimes as to what exactly do we give. The top 30 conduct crimes, uh, yes, the, the names remain both entirely the same across the country. Uh, but of course, like the, most of the financial year, most of the, our top 30 conduct crime stations, they do indicate a reduction, but the fact that the volume of cases remains high, then uh, they still remain on the top 30, but they only change. And these patients, what they need is uh, they need to be, if we are focusing on them, they need personnel, they need vehicles, they need IT. And that is what uh, myself and the team, we are going to make sure that we empower them. Uh, we should be aware that there has been a shortage all over, and including these top, top 30 stations, they have got a shortage in terms of personnel. So we need to pump more resources to these stations so that we make the life of the community uh, much more easier in that regard. Uh, the feeling of the Divisional Commissioner Crime Intelligence, uh, as Chairperson said, I must finalize it. Yes, I am busy with the process is uh, honorable chain members. I did receive some briefings and uh, I will be finalizing those processes as soon as possible. We are at that one stage in terms of uh, feeding some vacancies in that area. There are currently some posts of senior managers that we have ties, I think, the last week to get in this environment of uh, crime intelligence. So, I'm giving it my utmost attention and we will definitely finalize in very, very, um, in a very due course. Uh, in terms of uh, question around, this call will talk around the airwing capacity currently. Um, yeah, then uh, there was a question around why can we classify killing of police as a crime against the state. Uh, I will engage the civilian secretariat of police in that regard so that we can see uh, which legislation ever we amend, which state legislation if we need more, we we'll look at that as an area that we can at least venture into and see if we can uh, make sure that we Amend 
certain legislation to effect this crime. I do applaud the comment, it's commendable and it's in the right direction. Uh, in terms of uh, restructuring, General Kumar will speak to that. We are still busy with the, the restructuring. And uh, General Slavan will talk to the last audit of the parliament. Um, yeah, and then EMS will talk to synchronization of radios. Uh, let me give the team to answer some of the questions. We'll first start with uh, General Levia, and then General Puma, and then uh, Lieutenant General Musikidi, Mutala, and General Reed. And yeah, we'll go on with that question. Thanks, uh, all the good chapters. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, General Masimola, you have given the order for responses. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, I will start from the DPCI side, Lieutenant General Lebia. Uh, there are uh, five questions that I will be attending to that uh, relate to the uh, DPCI. Uh, firstly, let me appreciate uh, the commendation by the Honorable uh, Sheikh Imam on the successes registered by the DPCI. Uh, this will go a long way to encourage the members who are doing the work on the ground. Indeed, uh, I have observed that uh, they have secured uh, more than 13,000 accused persons uh, in court. And uh, these cases, uh, are most of them are pending, still pending in court. We appreciate that uh, message of uh, appreciation. Secondly, the questions from the Honorable Dr. Grunewald, uh, the first one having been dealt with by the minister, that is uh, the province where it belongs. I will not comment on that one. Uh, the second one dealing with uh, the question of uh, the status of uh, the case relating to the arson at parliament uh, present. Uh, I need to indicate that uh, the matter relating to the accused person, Mr. Murphy, is currently serving before court and the case is postponed to the 12th of May, 2022. What is uh, outstanding in that uh, investigation is only the reports uh, from the Forensic Science Laboratory uh, from the uh, criminal uh, record center, local criminal record center relating to the photo album, as well as uh, the report from the uh, Department of Public Works. Uh, once that is done, the matter will be ready for uh, trial. On the other side, we are investigating the possibility that uh, he may not have been acting alone and let me leave it at that. Uh, the other question from the Honorable Dr. Hrinevald relates to the matters of the TRC. How many cases uh, are we having on hand? How many have been finalized uh, and, and the like? In, with regards to the cases of uh, emanating for, from the TRC, I need to report that uh, we are having 100 cases on hand. Uh, it will be appreciated that uh, these matters, some of them come from back 1968. And the, um, we have uh, five matters already in court, in criminal court. We have got one matter in the inquest court. We have got 17 matters pending decision by the uh, National Prosecuting Authority. 
we have got uh, 17 matters that are under investigation at various stages in the different regions. Uh, the next question that I will be attending to comes from the Honorable um, Reverend Meshwe, uh, raising the concern that the public is saying that there are no convictions that they are uh, seeing, especially with regard to politicians. And they have indicated that there is a certain politician, a man, if I understood the question, how it is phrased, uh, looking at uh, the Terra Blanche, Honorable Terra Blanche's uh, matter, case. There are politicians that are not being arrested. The question is, are we scared? Uh, Honorable uh, Reverend Meshwe, I need to be indicating that uh, the DPCI operate without fear, favor, or prejudice. And uh, we have all taken an oath of office to that effect. Uh, indeed, there, there may not be visible convictions regarding uh, certain levels of politicians, but I must say that uh, we have effected an arrest on a number of politicians. We have councillors. We have got mayors. Uh, I wouldn't like to be citing examples, but we have got former ministers. Uh, we have got also uh, biblical ministers that uh, are included. Maybe uh, one can just look at the land issue in Pomalang and look at the uh, Mandela funeral scam look at the uh, at Queenie and other places where politicians are really also uh, involved and we have secured their attendance and in some case we even hear accusation that uh, we are arresting other politicians but we are not arresting others but i just needed to indicate that uh, where there is a case we do not discriminate and uh, we operate without fear, as I have stated. And I think that uh, the, the, the honorable uh, member, uh, Reverend Misha, can just take that uh, we are not seeing acquittals. Once arrests have been effected, we are not seeing acquittals. The conviction rate is always above 93%, as I have pointed out. So we are not losing them once we secure them in court. And uh, before they can be secured in court, we obviously have to be working in collaboration with the National Prosecuting Authority, who is mandated to make a decision whether to prosecute or otherwise. Uh, the second question from the Honorable Reverend Mishwe, uh, which has been uh, obviously partially covered by uh, General Masemula, the National Commissioner, uh, relates to the question of why is police killings not uh, classified as a crime against the state? Currently, the DPCI is uh, investigating cases relating to killing of police officials. And indeed, while it is not classified as a crime against the state, we, one of the areas that we look at is uh, the penal provision. Will it be making much difference if it was to be classified as a crime against the state and placed in a legislation and removed from the classification of being a murder in terms of uh, the uh, common law crime? Do you want to make it a statutory offense? And if so, what type of punishment do we want to uh, attract? Because currently the murder 
attract life sentence, which we believe is the highest that the court can meet, and they classified as a matter, as a matter. Uh, we we still believe that uh, it can attract the very same punishment, but uh, lawmakers uh, can indeed consider changing if they so wish. But I think that uh, General Masemola has indicated that uh, there will be attention that uh, will be given in this regard. I was just uh, indicating the view that uh, matter as it is, it can attract the highest punishment that the court can ever meet out. Uh, the fourth question is uh, coming from the Honorable uh, Ter Blanche. Uh, it also uh, go hand in hand with the questions uh, that uh, Honorable Reverend Mesha has raised regarding not seeing big criminals and the politicians. Uh, he also indicated that there is this man who is known, but uh, nothing is happening to that man. We are not aware of that man. But I think if there is a case, as I indicated, we operate without fear or favor. We would like to say that if there are specific cases that uh, we can look at, maybe we can be able to respond to that particular one. But otherwise, uh, we uh, want to continue to operate without fear or favor. We fear no one. Uh, those are the questions that are relate to the uh, DPCI and the, if there is anything that I may have left out, uh, we can be reminded to attend to it. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members. That is the response from the DPCI I submit. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson, uh, Honorable Members, uh, the Deputy Minister of Police, uh, National Commissioner of the South African Police Service, uh, DNCs, DPCI head, and Deputy All Generals in attendance, as well as other colleagues, protocol is observed. I will respond to questions, uh, the most popular one, which is the Kimberley matter. But before I respond to Kimberley, I just want to allude and explain the rationale uh, as asked by Honorable Member Shembeni with regard to the recruitment of 12,000 12, uh, personnel as pronounced by the President of the Republic of South Africa. The 12,000 recruitment as pronounced by uh, the president is divided as follows. We were supposed to recruit 7,000 this year uh, in, in, and train them in the next financial year, then we shall also be recruiting another 5,000. So this is how 12,000 is spread. Over and above that 12,000, we also were in a process as the South African Police Service to recruit within the organization uh, uh, reservists as well as Public Service Act officials, we, which is a total of 3,000 this financial year. Now, we had to add that uh, 3,000 plus 7,000, which we received from National Treasurer and the President in February this year, to give a total of 10,000 for this current uh, financial year. So we had to go back because we couldn't advertise. We had to go back to the process that was stalled in 2019, 2020, during the time when the COVID started after we advertised those posts. So the 7,000 was taken from those who have already gone through the process and they were ready to go to the college, but unfortunately due to uh, COVID-19, we could not train. So, so the 7,000 was taken from that uh, uh, group. 
but we had to also make sure that they meet the necessary requirement in terms of the recruitment process, amongst others, which is the medicals as well as the buccal samples, to make sure that when they go to the college, we're not going to recall them saying they have committed uh, some crime. They must go to the college being fully and being able we be content that they we did not employ employ criminals as it is it used to be the case. All that has to be done within a very short space of time. And as the history of the organization, we have never had an opportunity to recruit 10,000 recruits at once. So that impacted on the capacity that we currently have as an organization. Hence, we find ourselves in Kimberley. We have utilized all our basic colleges together with some of the um, in-service uh, colleges, which is normally responsible for training of different courses. But currently, they've taken some of the new recruits in order to accommodate this huge number of recruits. Currently, we have that the 9,768 uh, recruits that have reported to different colleges with 3,000 that is sitting at Kimberley. Uh, we equally also uh, advertised in order to try and acquire uh, and have a pool in regard to when they, we need the sciences in the labs, we wanted to be able to recruit within the organization. So we equally advertised 200 posts uh, externally for those uh, um, uh, children who might have obtained the BSc, uh, which the process is still undergoing, uh, they will they will start at the college once we have finalized the, the process during June this year. In order to complement, currently we have nine thousand seven hundred and sixty eight uh, recruits that have reported to different colleges. The number that is. Uh, we will increase the 200 in terms of the number of recruits that we'll re receive in order to top up to make it a total of 10,000. Now, our uh, members who are in Kimberley, of course, it is true there has been some challenges there at Kimberley. Last week, Monday, Lieutenant General Zulu and the team, they went to Kimberley to go and resolve those matters, amongst others, which I take note of the fact that the chairperson is given directive that we must submit a written report um, in the five priorities that were given to our national commissioner. But to put the committee at ease, amongst other challenges was the accommodation, the blankets, which has since been resolved. Uh, the issues of the long queues, they were cooking with 20 liter pots, small coal pots. Our team happens to be able to go and purchase bigger pots, 350 liter uh, electric pots, which they are busy installing. They even bought those uh, um, mobile kitchens as saving points, which will de subdivide the members in order to address the issues of the long queues. There is a, a clinic there with two doctors as well as nurses. Polmet is busy as we speak. Uh, they will be there up until tomorrow in finalizing the, the, the matters that need to be finalized to our students. We have since also have detached uh, the chefs from SAPS to go and assist with the menu because part of the issues as highlighted were the issues of the food. So the team is still there. General Zoom is here. She will be able to add some of the information where I'm living some information, but we'll be in a position to compile a report this week. The team is still addressing all those issues in regard to Kimberley. <clears throat> then the, the issue with regards to promotion, yes, we have not been promoting our members in the manner in which we should have had, and not even according to our policy, because our policy allowed members to have certain number of years. But uh, due to budgetary constraint, it has been quite a challenge for us to promote as uh, it used to be in the olden days. Now, amongst others, we have since even combined uh, 
extended to the number of years from constable to sergeant and sergeant warrant officer and we promoted them automatically in a form of a great progression but we had some backlog of those promotions as well of grading because of the budgetary constraints which we i think this year we are going to be able to alleviate it in to a certain extent but we can only promote them from constable up until warrant officers from warrant officer to captain it must be a, a supervisory post which depends on availability of the post so when coming to moving from those level it is quite a challenge uh, because it depends on post availability if posts are not there uh, and they are not even funded we cannot be able to promote them which is amongst others maybe one of the reasons why our compensation budget is ballooned but the cfo will be in a position to explain that particular uh, item the issue with regard to um the 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 education trust the education trust subset in the police has also been met with challenges because the we only have 1 million that is budgeted for and transferred from the police budget so that trust depended on the uh, sponsorships so due to the past two years since we had covid we could not do uh, the fund raising programs that we used to embark upon we have uh, experienced some serious challenges in regard to payment of the school fees to some of the children we had some backlog until we went to knock at the door of the old mutual who happened to be able to assist us this year with a 3.5 million for us to be able to cover for the school fees and we are planning to do also some fundraising this year since the market is opened but amongst others it was the board of directors most of them they couldn't function effectively due to covid-19 and as and when we started to follow up they all have since resigned and we have since requested our minister to assist us in identifying some of the members that can be in a position to form part of this board so that we are able to uh, move in terms of the uh, compliance for us to be able to continue with the fundraising exercises in order to address the school fees of our fallen heroes and heroines uh, the matter with regard to sita of course the chairperson has alluded to it but safe to say to provide feedback that up until today the board has not yet approved uh, our our firearm uh, contract they have identified uh, issues that they were not happy with and they referred it back to sita and uh, we are informed that it will appear on the 28th of april hoping it will receive attention this time around the issue also with regard to um, physical fitness we do have a, still a physical fitness program it has never stopped the sub's physical fitness maintenance policy number 2 of 2016 compares every uh, police act member to undergo summative uh, physical fitness assessment at least once a financial year and ensures that they meet the set minimum physical fitness standard according to their age and gender all provincial commissioners and divisional commissioners are assessed per semester in terms of the performance management framework in addition to that approval was granted for members to participate in the physical fitness assessment for two and a half hours per week as per sub physical fitness maintenance policy that i've already alluded to uh, the issue with regard to uh, reservists of course uh, we had a minimum uh, number of posts for reservists and obviously for all of them to be trained they need to meet those minimum requirements that have been set out amongst others is medicals as well as the 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 buccal samples as i alluded to 
So it is possible that some of the members, after they've done their medicals, they did not meet or pass or meet the required uh, standard, then they will not be called. And it will be really difficult for us to satisfy everybody because reservists that we have are more than the number of posts that we were allocated for based on the financial resources that are available. Uh, the issue with regards to restructuring, the restructuring is continuing as we explained to the committee in the previous meeting. Currently, the divisions and provinces are busy placing their senior managers. This week, they shall be presenting what they have placed in the meeting on Friday for us to, so that they are able to roll it out to um, level 12 downwards. And the, the issue with regards to the um, triple SPC agreement on restructuring that says it should end in 2024, this is based, of course, on the matter that is known to all of us that it is said that SUBS is top heavy in the head. So we have streamlined SUBS from six DNCs to three currently. The divisional commissioners were 16, they are currently 10. So the aim of this uh, restructuring amongst others, of course, is to implement those districts as pronounced by the president. So the issue of uh, it rolling out up to 2024, it has to do with the top heavy in terms of us having to reduce the plan and as it was presented to the council, triple SBC, it was presented that we need to move from three DNCs to two, as well as reducing further the divisions to a less than 10 number. That is what is aimed in terms of it having to roll out up to 2024. Um, I'm not so sure if there are questions that I might have left, but the issue with regard to the garages on allow General Reed to respond to, uh, and also if General Zulu will want to add in terms of her experience with regard to Kimberly, where she have left some of the information, she will be in a position to add, and the CFO will equally respond to the 78 0.3% of compensation budget. I think these are the questions that were relevant to my area of responsibility. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, General Labia and General Vuma, for those very good responses. We appreciate the work you're doing. General Vuma, you are holding the fort. Thank you very much. Um, General Abia, you're doing the, the best under difficult circumstances. We appreciate the work you are doing. Uh, who is next? Uh, can we get General Zulu and uh, Pemba if there is anything to add? Thanks on the picture. <laughs> Chairperson, uh, Deputy Minister, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, uh, Deputy National Commissioners, Head of GPCI, uh, colleagues, uh, good morning. Uh, Chairperson, I will, Honorable Chairperson, I will just uh, say that uh, General Evuma covered most of the stuff that we asked, and in a written response also it will cover some details of other issues that maybe that we, we, we addressed maybe were not highlighted pre uh, previously uh, by the complaints, but because we had to attend to them when we visited, we saw that they were also hampering service delivery. They have already also addressed them well in terms of that. Maybe the issue was the issue of the detached, uh, the trainers. If we have enough trainers to, uh, I mean, to train this uh, 9,768 trainees, Yes, we do have, uh, as SAPS, we do have the pool of trainers in the provinces as well as in the divisions, like your, yeah, the division HR, uh, HRT as well as the ORS 
uh, or visible policing. They've got a lot of trainers that we also get from them. So each and every time if we've got training, because we can't keep so many people uh, who are operational in the training environment. What we do, we maintain their standards in terms of assessment and moderation so that when the, the need comes, we call them and we detach them during that particular period. So everything is in place. Where the trainer is not available, the provincial commissioner, they will always uh, give us the replacement so that we can be able to have the, uh, enough trainers. As we are talking right now, the trainers are there, where then those that did not report, that those also that they still need to report, then we are, we are always updating. So, but we gave up the collapse instruction and then we're paying also for their necessary services that they need to, like your service allowance, uh, I mean, the, the, the SNTs, as well as the food that they had to, I mean, to get or in accommodation. So, but in everything then uh, regarding Kimberley, uh, we appreciate the, uh, the honorable chairperson for giving us the opportunity so that we can state the case and then how have we done, uh, I mean, in order to solve this problem. And thank you so much for the support that you have provided also to the Kimberly Chairperson as we are on that side. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, General Dr. Zulu. Um, it's uh, very good to hear that uh, you're on top of uh, your game. Um, and we hope that we will receive less complaints from Kimberley. I trust that uh, what you are doing will remedy the situation. Uh, who is next? Major General Temba, if there is anything to add, thanks on the picture. Thank you. Um, good morning to the Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members. Uh, of uh, General Temba. Uh, your volume is very, very soft. Could you maybe just um, increase your volume? Okay. Um, am I audible now, Chairperson? Uh, I, I'm sure the rest of the members also have that problem. Uh, members, can you hear uh, General Timba? No, Chairperson, we can't hear you. All right. We, we all have a problem. Can you maybe move to another gadget? Or increase your volume? Uh, no, Chair, I, I suggest that uh, General Masemula, if you can uh, hear get me now. her to con Yeah, yes, we yes, can yes. hear you now. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, DM. Uh, good morning to you, Chairperson, to Honorable Members, the Deputy Minister the National Commissioner, the head of DPCI and all generals present. Um, General Vuma covered most of the issues that are the HR related issues that were raised uh, by honorable members. Maybe just to add on the issue of reservists, that um, uh, several dispensations were made to accommodate uh, reservists. And out of the 9,768 that is currently uh, in uh, training, 1,710 of those uh, were reservists uh, that were allocated to form part of this training. So um, in most cases, those who are currently expressing dissatisfaction over the recruitment pre period, we are in the process of checking, but most of them, it's a matter of not meeting the requirements. The related to the fitness, medical, uh, the medical examination, and also the fitness. But we engaged with them uh, last week as HR. We got the list we are checking, and we have um, we, uh, a working relationship with their chairperson that we, where we are going to give them feedback as to what are the issues that uh, of those that uh, did not make it uh, to qualify for this um, recruitment process. Uh, thank you very much, uh, chairperson. Yeah. Thank you very much, General Temba. Next. General Rick. General Rick, you are next. General Rick, there's no sound. Yes, General Rick. General Rick, there's no sound coming from you.
Okay. Uh, General Reed, do you have a, a problem with your sound? Maybe we can take uh, General Sintumule and General Mushala uh, for the chat. Uh, while General Riti is sorting out his gadget, could we have the next? Thank you very much, Dr. Oh, there's another problem there. General Massimula, it seems as if we we have some problems on your side. Okay, thanks, uh, Honorable Chair. Am I audible now? You you are audible, but your generals that you're asking to respond, they're not audible. A general be available thanks. now again. General yeah, Simtumula is with me. She's available. Thanks, Honorable Chair. All right, Honorable Chair. Can I test that in my audible honorable check? You are just very soft. Okay, I'll try and speak louder, honorable chair. Um, greetings to you, to the honorable members, the deputy minister of police. Honorable mm -hmm. members, are, are you happy with the sound? Hi, Chairperson, I can't hear what uh, he said. Um, we're having a problem with sound now. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. I'm not sure now if I'm audible enough. Wonderful. Now we can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Greetings to you, to the Honorable Members, the Deputy Minister of, of Police, the National Commissioner, the National Head of the DPCI, General Libya, DNC General Vuma, all the DEVCOMs on the platform and colleagues. Chairperson, I am going to respond to the first question to, uh, from Honorable Khunevald, that's in relation to FDA. And I must put a disclaimer here, Chair, that I'll only res respond to the issue that talks to the uh, FDA uh, still being in possession of samples, which could jeopardize the chain of evidence as we presented to court, because those could actually um, be exposed to degradation and hence affect our conviction rate in terms of your uh, serious violent crimes. Um, Chairperson, with your permission, the information I have at my disposal um, is that there are no samples held by the DF, uh, sorry, by the FDA. However, there could be old data which could still be housed within the PCAM. Um, however, Chairperson, I would like to uh, specify that in adhering to principles of honesty and information verification, we take note of the concern and therefore I am going to request the Chairperson to, to allow us to go back and conduct our due diligence uh, investigation in relation to the concern as raised by the Honourable Member and this will allow us an opportunity to provide a factual report in this regard to the portfolio committee. Thank you, Chair. The second matter that I'm also going to respond to talks to the matter of instigators, as also raised by the Honorable Kuneval. Uh, Chairperson, from the detective side, we were investigating 12 cases linked to the July um, 2021 unrest. Of the cases where we had arrests, two were withdrawn in court. Nine cases are ready for trial. Uh, uh, I think about three of them are starting today, um, and the rest will also go up until September. And one case of the 12th is with the DPP for decision. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I will then move to the other question that came from Honorable Tara Blanche and that talks to the declining or the continuous declining in the detection rate uh, for SAPS, which means that we are not successful in our resolving of crime. Um, uh, Honorable uh, Sheikh, 
earlier on mentioned that we also have got good plans. I think also Honorable uh, Terebrant mentioned that. And we must say that I think from the period 2019 to 2021, when there was a decline in detection rate, recovery plans were put in place. And I think those on paper look good. However, the impact on the ground is not visible. So as a result, after we did our um, assessment of the situation and, and, and coming up with your mitigating measures, so our posture is as follows. In terms of operational interventions, we are launching uh, the first ever branch commanders forum for the detectives where the branch commanders together with the district commanders who are responsible for detectives will um, be reporting on a monthly basis in terms of the station ca uh, case management, but also looking at the station mode, most wanted, the issue of your prolific of offenders, um, the, the, uh, and also they will look at your dismissed appeals. Those um, uh, are people who, who, who plead not guilty and they would be found guilty. And when they um, submit their appeals, when it is denied, you also have to go and re-arrest those, uh, those, those perpetrators, uh, which is something that is not, not happening prevalently right currently. But also the other point is that uh, we are not utilizing your forensic lead enough, like your IBIS lead, your DNA leads, also which would help us deal with linking suspects to, to, to matter whether it's person to person or person to crime or crime to crime. Uh, the last part also that, that we look at is the, in terms of this, it's the down management of the docket on hand, particularly for um, investigators who are carrying 100 or more dockets. And in this regard, we are also reviewing the, the, the norms in terms of what is acceptable in relation to your docket load between an investigator as well as, as, as the docket load. The other thing that is very important and I think is coming to the business environment is the issue of your combined assurance where all the lines of command uh, uh, from the combined assurance who are the first line of defense will then have to do a continuous regular update on the system, but also make sure that they manage the, the station um, docket workload including the checklist for all dockets, uh, physical dockets, as well as the dockets on the uh, on the um, on, on the e-docket system, but also importantly, the issue of data integrity. Um, in relation to our strategic interventions, it's about capacity building. Uh, Chairperson from the twelve thousand and uh, um, enlistments that are currently take, taking place, as the detectives, we are going to get a thousand seven hundred and fifty and those will all be directed to the station. Of those 375 will go to um, FCS, and one 375 will be distributed to all the other de uh, detective uh, centers at a provincial level. And also, uh, we are in the process of, sorry, process of currently re-enlisting uh, our retired experienced detectives who will focus on our cold cases for contact time, which is where we are struggling with our detection rate. And these are cases which are three years and older. They take into account your murders, attempted murders, uh, assault GPAs, assault common and others. And our starting point will be at your top 30 high contact time weight stations. We, we have other interventions chair, but the report will be submitted um, to the chairperson for interrogation in terms of what is contained in our recovery plan. Uh, I think uh, chairperson, that is the issues from myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chuck. Well, thank you very much, General. Uh, could we try General Rita again? NASCOM is generally right close to you. Uh, no, uh, Honorable Chair is somewhere else, but I uh, know he's changing, he's connecting his phone, uh, trying to connect his phone so that he can come in. But we can take General Masala in the meantime. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, honorable members, uh, honorable deputy minister uh, of police, 
our national commissioner, General Masemola, national head of DPC. Uh, Honorable Chair, uh, no, we, can't hear, we can't hear clearly. It's, it's very soft. Yes. Agreed, Honorable Khrunova. Uh, could we have a little bit more volume, please? Uh, good morning, Honorable Chairperson. Can, am I audible now? Yes, much better. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, let me firstly observe protocol. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister of Police, uh, Mr. Kassel Matale, uh, our National Commissioner, General Masemola, the National Head of DPCI, General Libya, uh, all protocol observed. Honorable Chairperson, there was a question on the, on the, uh, the air wing capacity. The total fleet that we are having uh, for the air wing is the total is 34, and currently operational uh, is 11. Uh, due to the flood flood situation in 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 KZN, we have actually uh, together with other uh, law enforcement agencies, but from our side as, as South African Police Service, we have deployed a total four, three choppers and one fixed wing. And the reason for the, the fluctuation of the, the uh, availability of the, the, our air wing capacity is that uh, some of this air wing uh, capacity, there is mandatory services that they're supposed to undergo. Uh, for example, when they have reached a particular uh, period, they must actually uh, be be subjected to a, a particular uh, service maintenance. And that's why it is fluctuating from time to time. But we are in the process, uh, honorable chairperson and honorable members, uh, with the assistance of the, the, the division supply chain management to ensure that uh, we procure a new uh, capacity for our air wing so that we can be able to increase the the, the, the fleet with a new capacity, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Chairperson, on the issue of the, the question on what has been done differently to address uh, gender-based violence, especially at, the, at our top 30 police station, just to add that uh, one of the things that we are doing, Honorable Chairperson, is to ensure that uh, we after we've done the crime patterns and crime threat analysis, we are actually zooming into uh, ensuring localized intervention uh, between myself and General uh, General Sintumule. Uh, uh, we're working very closely uh, to ensure that the, uh, one of the things that we do is the tracing of the uh, wanted suspects and also to ensure that uh, we, 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 we we conduct more community outreach programs. And one of the things that uh, we, we have been doing, especially through the office of the ministry, is, is where we are actually even now going to, to uh, our education and awareness programs. We are actually focusing more on street level to ensure that the, uh, the community outreach and education and awareness is actually more focused, uh, 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 which also include uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, the issue of door to door, uh, and also ensuring that the crime prevention operations are actually localized uh, in those uh, identified hotspots. Hence, we have the, also the budget that has been allocated so that we can have extra capacity, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members, uh, within those uh, identified uh, hotspot uh, uh, stations. Uh, to ensure that we, we decrease uh, gender-based violence. That's all from my side, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chair. Yes. Yes, Honorable Khrunova. Uh, Chair, sorry. Uh, the uh, audio was not that good. Can I just get that first uh, figures or numbers again? I, I, I heard something about 74, but... Can I just can it just be repeated the the numbers uh, operational and non-operational, please? Thank you. 
Thank you, Honorable Kurunova. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The total fleet is, uh, is 34, 34. And those that are operational currently is 11. And we have de currently deployed uh, due to uh, our mission that flood uh, to, to assist the, the citizen <laughs> province. We have actually uh, deployed four, which is three choppers and one fixed beam honorable chairperson. I submit. Sorry, Chair. I, uh, I, I'm rude, maybe, but. Can, uh, 34 is the fleet, but how many of that fleet uh, uh, do we have as uh, helicopters and uh, uh, fast wing uh, uh, airplanes, please? Could you assist us, please? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, currently, out of the total of 11 that is operational, uh, we have six helicopters that are available and five fixed wings. And then the total, the other total honorable chairperson and honorable members, I, I can request that we, we do a submission in writing so that we can ensure that we have a very consolidated uh, uh, input. Uh, General, um, uh, General Massimola, do you have any assistance on this? Thanks, Honorable uh, Chairperson. Uh, yes, your volume. Yeah. I need yeah. a little volume, please. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think it's within our it's within us to attend to some of the uh, um, uh, concerns. I am aware that uh, with regard to the Pilatus fleet, currently we do not have a contract. So uh, I will myself and General Puma, the General fleet, have to expedite that so that we have. A contract and we have those uh, fleet uh, mobile that will affect uh, about uh, nine uh, PC6 plus the PC12. But for the chopper fleet, I'm aware there is a, there is a contract. Thank you, Honorable Chief. Uh, uh, a national commissioner, I agree with the members, even uh, Honorable De Blanche that your figures do not sound right. Uh, could you please verify your information? And uh, uh, next week we'll be on recess, but could you send the information to me in the meantime? Uh, if you have responses by Friday, I'll also give you an opportunity on Friday uh, to give us updated figures. But your figures definitely do not sound uh, correct. Uh, I'm not going to say that you are not correct. Uh, could I then just say that um, you come back with a more definitive and accurate picture? Um, honorable members, would that assist you? Honorable Thank Tablanche, you. could they come Thank back you. on Friday? Thank you, Chairperson, yes. Honorable Grunewald? Thank you, Chair. And, and it must be a comprehensive report. Uh, I heard what said that we must uh, pose a question uh, because at this moment it <clears throat> actually says that there are only 11 planes uh, operational of the 34. I think it's correct. Uh, but what's wrong? It is quite clear that we want a comprehensive report uh, when it comes to the maintenance, uh, the number of pilots available, uh, for each, uh, we must distinguish between helicopters and fixed wing uh, uh, planes because, I mean, you can't use, uh, well, we need helicopters. It's as simple as that. So if we can have a comprehensive report by Friday, I will highly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. You will be given an opportunity to update us on Friday. Um, do we have any further responses? 
I still have a uh, uh, general writ. Is he available now? I, I, I think he should. He was struggling, Chair. He, he says when he, he wants to speak, the system says you are not allowed to unmute. So I then asked him to reconnect or use a different gadget. If we can check whether he's connected now, Chair. Um, could the host also ensure that we uh, the host has unmuted all of us? Um, uh, General Dimpani? Thank you very much, Chairperson. There are a few questions that still needs to be responded to. I'll start with the COE one on 78%, the concern that was raised by Honorable Kunewald. Yes, Chairperson, this uh, percentage is also a concern for us. Ideally, we should be at 75%. I must indicate that in 2019-20, we were at 79.5%. We, as a department, are participating in initiatives such as the early exit. We participated in order for us to down manage this percentage. We also, uh, as alluded to by General Voma, the issue of restructuring is also attempting to assist the department to down manage. However, I must indicate that all these initiatives, we are mindful not to affect the resource allocation, especially at local level, especially at station level, to ensure that we do have sufficient capacity at station level to ensure that we maintain our policing requirements in terms of visibility. The uh, other issues that also impact on this particular percentage is the benefits or the basic of uh, conditions that are as per the agreements that would have been signed for uh, in terms of uh, within the various councils, uh, Chairperson, but it is of a concern. We are uh, putting measures in place to ensure that we don't manage it. However, we do not also want to affect the availability of resources, especially on station level. There is also a question from uh, Honorable Sarah Blanche on the program two. Uh, a percentage that is 1%. We had indicated on one of the slides that program two was impacted. If you will recall, Chair, in the 21 22 financial year, we had once off allocations. We also had the um, rollovers that were approved that are not necessarily part and parcel of the allocation for this year. We were dealing with issues of unrest where we had one of allocations from National Treasury to deal with that, and they were also accounted for within program two. So when you compare the allocation of previous financial year to this financial year, those amounts are, uh, have been uh, subtracted, and hence you will see the amount um, decreasing in terms of program two. There was also a question from Honorable Sadi in terms of understanding. Uh, Chair, we must just indicate that there has been improvement for the previous financial year as we compared to the 2020-21 financial year. The spending uh, as we closed the financial year was at 99.13%. Uh, Chairperson, there were measures that the department had put put in place to ensure that the allocation that uh, we had in the previous financial year is spent in this regard. However, this will also be outlined as an only table, the annual report later during this year. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, General Reed is ready to come in, uh, Chairperson, if you may allow. He's connected yes. now. Yes, thank you, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Uh, can you hear me now, Chair? Oh, there's an echo. Could the others switch off their gadgets? Yeah. Uh, uh, is there a question there, Chair? No. You, yeah, uh, you can try again. You can speak now. No, Good morning, Chair. Can you hear me now? Yes, continue. Now, thank you very much, Chair. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning to the Deputy Minister, uh, National Commissioner, Member of Parliament, the head of the DPCI, and my fellow colleagues, senior officers. Uh, Chair, I'm going to first try, start with a question coming from the Honorable Ted Blanche, which was referring to the MEC that visited uh, the, uh, the stations in KZN. I can just confirm that I haven't seen such a report from the MEC. Maybe I will just follow up with the, with the provincial commissioner, perhaps maybe he's having this particular report. 
because sometimes it happens that uh, MECs are being given uh, feedback from the various provincial offices. And if this particular matter, this the intervention of National Day will all normally escalate it to the National Office, but I can just confirm I haven't received such a report. Uh, Chairperson, with regard to the question about the two police stations that we managed to uh, build in this financial year, yes, quite correct. Uh, if you can remember, Chair, I'm also on record in the previous uh, portfolio committee uh, session where I did indicate that uh, we did have serious problems in the environment of our facility, and I, and I believe Minister Treblanche is quite aware of it because he came from that particular environment also, where we, we have various reasons where our projects couldn't proceed. Uh, Chairperson, uh, as I was indicating earlier um, in terms of my submissions, that uh, we also uh, made some investigations, a uh, forensic investigation, which my co uh, colleague department in the uh, internal order actually uh, drove those particular investigations and uh, about things that went wrong in, in the terms of uh, 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 constructing police stations. But I can just say that we are start, uh, currently now turning the wheels in terms of uh, building police stations. Chair, uh, chairperson, uh, Maybe if I can just maybe make mention of the uh, financial years in terms of our five-year strategic plan, which is actually this particular financial, we we going to construct three police stations. Then the next financial, which is 2023, 24, is about seven. And uh, financial year 24, 25, financial year 13, and uh, 2025, 26 is eight, uh, which gives you a total of 33 police stations, which include the two police stations that was made mentioned by Honorable Blanche. Uh, Chairperson, I can also just make mention that uh, the challenges that we experienced, we managed to co correct them, especially with the uh, assistance of the minister, who actually granted us uh, 14 posts for professionals to be employed in the South African Police Service, which we have had hunted, uh, which is going to do a, a, a lot of, of, of assistance in terms of uh, uh, getting our professions in place to, to, to build this particular police station. So, Chairperson, the backlog that we, we, that we had in that particular uh, quiet period because of various problems, we're trying to, to, to uh, keep up with those backlogs and actually, eventually, we will actually manage to uh, proceed as we are supposed to proceed, especially during the time when Minister Honorable Blanche was also in the police service. Then, uh, Chairperson, in terms of the garages, uh, my national commissioner did indicate as to what is our plan, and uh, I can just confirm what he said about taking the garages back to the provinces for proper management because eventually these vehicles belong to the provinces. And uh, the vehicle fleets are also in the provinces. We, we, we have noticed that when the, the garages were at national level, the vehicle fleet guys didn't actually do what they were supposed to be doing. And uh, it, which is going to give much proper prop control because uh, the garages are in the provinces. Whilst we were in the national office, the control was a little bit uh, 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 shaky. And uh, uh, with the provincial commissions now taking proper control of it, it will actually improve the situation. But I can just indicate that uh, there was a time that we have our vehicle availability at 70%. And we put up a target for 80% and we've actually achieved it. Now we're working towards a new target of 90% of vehicle availability. Uh, we, we are standing now at 82% as we are speaking, and we're working to the, the particular target. Uh, I can also just indicate that we've got merchants in place, uh, which is uh, spread across the countries, across the provinces, across stations, uh, meaning that actually the lowest level of, of merchants who are mechanics are also trying to assist us by uh, repairing our vehicles. I fully agree that issue of uh, Honorable Shin Benny when he talks about batteries because it's definitely a simple matter. And the National Commissioner did talk about as to what we will do about it in terms of putting a new process in place to make sure that graduates are 24 hours operational. We still have to implement that. But then in terms of the the, 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 the time, turnaround time, I can just indicate for services, it's, it's still our target for one day. For minor repairs, we still have a target of five days. Major repairs is 15 days, and the collision of and major damages, we have got a target of 30 days. Chairperson, that is uh, also if I can see, but I can just also indicate, Chairperson, the, the last point, which was General Makala was talking about, uh, about procuring new fleet, because we're sitting with old fleet, and uh, it was very long time back that the South African Police Service procured a uh, new fleet. 
Now, I can just announce that uh, we we started now to uh, procure uh, uh, helicopters. Uh, the one helicopter we've already successfully procured it. We are just waiting for its arrival back in the country because we're waiting for this particular helicopter from uh, France. And the second one is also we are in the process to procure the second uh, helicopter. Hopefully, if there's enough funds, then we can actually uh, procure much more uh, in this new financial year. Uh, but uh, eventually, I fully agree with Jamukala. We need to replace our old fleet because uh, technology is changing, and that's where we we, we struggle with parts with this uh, to fix this particular old fleet. Also, uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, um, National Commissioner. I'm very pleased. Thanks, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, yeah. General Shawani and General Khan. Yes, National Commissioner. Who's your next person? Is uh, General Shawani and uh, General Khan, Honorable Chair. Uh, we may have the last two. Good morning, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, as well as uh, Honorable Deputy Minister and the National Commissioner. I, I missed, I'm sorry, the National Commissioner. I missed the question uh, for Program 5 because I was struggling with the budget. I'm not sure whether I'm Honorable. I'm, yes. I'm audible, I'm sorry. Yes, you are audible. If you missed your question, uh, is there someone who can assist you? Yeah, thanks, Honorable Chair. The question was the audit of the national key findings in the parliament. When was it last audited and what was the findings and recommendations? Thank you. Thank you, NASCOM. General oh, the question was about the national parliament and national commission in terms of the uh, findings in as, in, in as far as the investigation is concerned. Yes. And also the national key points when last they were audited. Um, the investigation, um, it's, 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 it's ongoing, um, Honorable Chair. The, however, what I can report is that the, uh, the two members that were on duty at uh, 100 Plain Street, uh, they have been um you know redeployed to you know various stations outside the protection as well as the captain that was on duty the relief commander and the when it comes to the uh, the assessment that was done in parliament uh, currently what we have done we have not done a reassessment the only thing that we have done, we have inducted the acting sector, um, sector of parliament, as well as the deputy, um, you know, chair for JCP. Um, what we'll be doing, we'll be sending a team, I think, in the next um, uh, two weeks, uh, that will be doing the complete, um, you know, um, assessment of things that would still need to be done. But we have also uh, had a discussion uh, with, uh, you know, the um, public works and infrastructure in terms of the, uh, you know, the implementation of the uh, physical infrastructure that has to be done, uh, which um, I think it, after they would have done in terms of the new National Assembly, in terms of uh, whether it's going to be fixed, then it means uh, then, in as far as the perimeter and all the, uh, you know, the um, physical security uh, things that have to be done, uh, they will be able to implement. Because uh, if we remember, uh, Honorable Chair, what was still outstanding was the heritage of Cape Town, but they've given us a go ahead to, you know, implement, you know, the um, the shelter and the entrances, the vehicle entrances, which was the issue, especially in front at, uh, at Roland Street. Uh, so this is where we stand in terms of the, um, the assessment. But that would be done. And then what would also happen is that uh, we're going to do then also an, an induction, uh, because in terms of the national key point, indeed, uh, before we 
uh, because since we have declared the whole precinct as a key point, we have not done the uh, the complete induction to the presiding officers, that is the executive authority of parliament. So we're still waiting for a date so that then we can then take them through in terms of what is expected, um, you know, as the national key point, uh, meaning the speaker, the deputy speaker, as well as the chair of the uh, National Assembly, as well as deputy. Thank you, uh, National Commissioner and the Honorable Chair. Uh, thank you very much, General. Uh, now we'll take the last one, General Khan. Good morning, Honorable Chair. Uh, good morning, DM, National Commissioner, National Head of the DPCI, um, the DNC is on the platform, Honorable Members, uh, all other Lieutenant Generals and colleagues. Uh, Honorable Chair, my response um, will be on two issues raised by the Honorable Dr. Krunewald. The first being his concern over the two years that the National Commissioner has to be able to achieve uh, what is uh, set out for him uh, as a National Commissioner of the Police. Just to indicate, uh, Honorable Chairperson, that the contract of the National Commissioner is running from the 1st of April 2022 until the 31st of March 2027. This is in accordance with uh, uh, the Constitution, Section 207-1, uh, 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 where the, uh, the President has exercised his prerogative, as well as Section 7 of the SAPS Act and Section 45 of the SAPS Act. So Section 7 of the SAP, SAPS Act regulates the appointment of the National Commissioner and indicates that his appointment is for a period of five years. So, in the case of the National Commissioner, uh, his age of retirement is determined by the contract that regulates his appointment, and this can actually continue further than the age of 60. So, since the term of the National Commissioner can also be extended in terms of Section 45.4 that deals with uh, retirement of, of members, uh, the National Commissioner can actually run a second term beyond that age. So Chair, that's as far as the um, concern that was raised by the Honorable Dr. Kunavald is concerned. Uh, in addition, Chair, in terms of the court cases on FDA, uh, I must indicate that the litigation is ongoing. We have the one matter where FDA has issued summons uh, and the matter is in court uh, for, for breach of contract by the police in terms of uh, the intellectual property and the computer programs. And uh, in that regard, uh, they, they're claiming uh, an amount of, uh, I think it's about 560 million. Uh, the matter is ongoing at this point in time. And the second one relates to a letter of demand for uh, loss of profit, defamation and loss of earnings. And uh, that claim, the letter of demand uh, uh, runs uh, into an amount of three billion one hundred ninety-one million. So both those matters are in. Oh, sorry, chair. The first matter is in court, and the second one is a letter of demand. Uh, we are awaiting uh, further uh, uh, communication from FDA in that regard, as far as uh, possible uh, summons are concerned. Thank you, chair. Uh, thank you very much, honourable members. Honourable chair, sorry. Uh, I'm coming to you now. Okay, thank you. Um, honorable members, I'm not going to take a round of new questions now. If you feel that your question was not adequately responded to, you may raise your hand now. Uh, Dr. Grunewald, do you fall under that category? Uh, Dr. Hrunova? Chair, I just want yes. to understand correctly. <clears throat> so what is being said that the commissioner of police is actually excluded uh, as far as the police act is concerned when it comes to retirement and the age, just because of the fact that the president can or appoints the national commissioner uh, is, 
Is that what I heard? Because I don't think that is a correct interpretation. Well, could we have a response to that, please? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, that is, the that is our interpretation, Chair. Uh, the, the National Commissioner is bound by the contract that he has with the President, and it could go beyond uh, uh, his age of 60 years, which is provided for in Section 45.4 of the um, Police Act. Thank you, Chair. Uh, could we please, could we please check this? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I really don't understand. Uh, General, um, um, sorry, Honorable Grunewald, could we get clarity on this? Because I also have serious doubts about this one, but we all stand under correction. Honorable Grunewald? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I haven't got the, the act with me. Uh, it, uh, the general refers to 46, uh, section 46. I will have to go and check on that uh, because it doesn't make sense because uh, it's a member, the moment you're a commissioner, uh, you are a member of the South African Police Services. But uh, maybe if, well, let's see. I, I, I'll have to look uh, at, at the wording of section 46. Uh, could we take that on Friday as well, please? Uh, um, Dr. Grunewald, could we take that on Friday? Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. There's two matters that I'll come back to on Friday. Could you please list the matters that I need responses to on Friday? Um, and you could start with my five items as well. Kimberly is very well covered. Um, the one on, uh, so you could just, uh, you can contact me as well, National Commissioner, so that we can see how far we can get with my other four items. Um, if you tell me, uh, General Vuma gave me a good response on Kimberley. Thank you, General Vuma. Um, any members, do you need follow-up questions? Honorable Shembeni, and then Honorable Siabi. Yes. Uh, so, can you hear me? Honorable Shembeni, your, your network. All right, I will say. Your network. You can try. I don't know what is happening, but I can hear everybody clearly. Yes, I did not uh, get exactly when was the last security audit and the evaluation conducted in the parliament as a national key point complex. And what were the findings from the recommendations thereafter? Uh, thank you, Honorable Shembeni, Honorable Siabi, and then Honorable Tablanche. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Honorable Shembeni, Honorable Siabi, Honorable Whoop, and then Honorable Tablanche. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, maybe I must start with the issue of the of the performance target that was removed. I questioned about that, about the the I don't know whether you call them monkey talks or or what. But I ask a question about uh, why is the APP now removing the the target, especially after the human rights investigative process raised concerns um, around that that there was no communication and people relied on cell phones with regard to the July 
July unrest. And um, the and that was in the context of the ICT plan that I said uh, was not visible. Of course, on the issue of CETA, it was well, well addressed. My other question, Chair, which was partly raised, it's uh, the concern, and I think it's the concern of the committee, the killing of police officers and the the, the, the police officers who are involved in suicide. And in most cases, after killing their families uh, and then killing themselves. Now, those two is a concern. But in the APP, um, it is not coming out clear. Even in the budget estimate, it's not coming out clear as to what the National Commissioner is going to do or what processes is he going to put in place, what systems is he going to place to try and assist these police officers. Are they, is it because of stress? Is it because of the salary? Some of them end up, uh, is, the, is, is this police officers who end up in criminal activities uh, contributing to this? So I didn't hear it clear as to what is the plan with regard to this issue. Thank you, Chair. Um, Honorable National Commissioner, this is not the first time that the Honorable Whoop mentions this matter. Uh, we need a response. I do not like the Honorable Whoop to repeat the same question. He has uh, asked this question before in the committee. Um, Honorable Shembeni, are you going to try again? Yes, uh, I don't know whether you can hear me clearly now. Um, Honorable Shembeni, continue. We'll try our best to hear you. If not, can you just put it in the chat group? Honorable Shembeni, speak. Okay, Chairperson. Uh, I forgot one question about this border management agency. Uh, I want to just clear it to find out as to what is happening here into this border management agency. Is it under the SAPS? Is it under the uh, SARS? Is it under immigration? What is happening? Who is leading this? I understand that just heard by other people that there were some posts advertised. Um, if somebody within this committee that is here now, I mean, from the leadership of the SAPS that is here now, can we get a clarity as to what is happening here? Who is leading this border management agency? Uh, are they going to take over the work of the South African police service in the borders? What? What is happening? Thank you. Uh, Honorable Tablon. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Honorable Shimbeni. We heard you. Uh, I'm done, sir. Uh, I don't know whether I was audible or not. Uh, thank you, Honorable Shimbeni. I allowed you to speak because we could we could formulate some uh, aspects of the question. We could uh, formulate a response. Uh, Honorable Tablon. Chairperson, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we also ask questions 
about the poor responses or no responses that you get phoning 10111. And then I also raised once again the issue of uh, getting, you know, if, you know, if you phone a police station or even the top management in the provinces to get a response after hours. And I just want to know what the police intends to do about it or intend to do about it, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Minister, would you like to come in, please? No, th th thanks, Chair, and thanks to members, and thanks to uh, National Commissioner and the team for the responses. Uh, like, I think uh, if there are issues that uh, we might have missed, I think uh, we, we, we should be reminded and we'll, we'll respond appropriately to the committee. But I think we, we have responded to all the questions that have been uh, raised. Thank you very much, Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, National Commissioner. Thanks, uh, Honorable uh, Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members. Uh, General Prozenja, uh, I will answer on the synchronization of radios, and General Temba and General Puma will respond on suicide and femicide. Uh, in terms of the DMA, Honorable Chairperson, the Border Management Agency. Yes, they uh, they are going to do uh, their function within the cause of entry as well as uh, on the borderline. Uh, in terms of the mandate, they are going to take over the responsibility in that specific area. Honorable Chair, recall that in their legislation, there is an area called uh, border law enforcement area, which in terms of the law, it is the exclusive operational area of the PMA. Uh, then going to back to the constitution, mandates the police to do their functions in terms of the constitution everywhere in the country. So there will be collaboration between us and them, including the SADF, but yes, they are responsible for uh, doing uh, the border law function within the cause of entries. Currently, we are in the process. We had a meeting with the commissioner of the DMA somewhere last week, and uh, both the minister of police and the minister of uh, home affairs also did meet. We are currently just uh, cleaning just some of the issues in terms of uh, what is it that is taken over by the BMA and what is it that will be left for the, in terms of within the police. So we are cleaning, still cleaning that space. Uh, soon we'll be able to categorically know exactly what is uh, taken over by BMA and what remains uh, within the SAPS. Uh, I'll ask the uh, General Puma and General Tuzinjali to follow. Thank you very much for the picture. Uh, thank you very much, National Commissioner. Uh, General Vuma. Thank you very much, Honorable Shepherdson. We have the Divisional Commissioner for TMS in attendance. She will be able to explain the issue of the radios and the ICT plan. Uh, General Tunzelani, please, with your permission, Chair. Thank you, General Buma. Um, to the National Commissioner, to our Deputy National Commissioners, to our Honorable Deputy Minister, to Honorable Chair, to Honorable Members, to our uh, head of DPCI to all our generals and lieutenant generals and all the uh, members um, that are honorable and all protocol observed. When it comes to the ICT plan, we, we are 60% through working through the ICT plan. So the IS and the ICT strategy has been really gaining momentum. And also we have submitted our annual performance plan and also our annual operational plan and we will complete the rest of the strategy the 40 percent that's outstanding 
in terms of the radio communication options that are available with SEPs, we have um, the Tetra, which is the terrestrial trunk radio, and also we have the digital mobile radio and the analog, um, which is what we are currently using. We are now um, doing Project 25 to ensure that we are synchronizing the radio communication at the moment. When it comes to the Tetra standard, we have associated with the microwave backbone, which is helping us to uh, mitigate the existing problems. Um, the problems that we have, we are having challenges with secure and independent network for the South African Police Service. But now this is also including the SAPS um, persons and also um, the access to information over the network. So what we are doing right now, we are improving the authentication and also the registration of the A interface and the encryption and end-to-end -end encryption so that we can at least improve um, the security within the radio communication platforms. What we're also doing is, is to ensure the geographical coverage to make sure that all the operational requirements that are existing within SEPs are being responded to. One of the things that we are finding is a challenge is that the value-added services are based now on the existing um, challenges. I must highlight to the committee and to the honorable members that are on the call. One of the things that we have found as we were doing our strategy is that we found a very high risk of um, the ICT infrastructure um, that is persistent. For example, in the Western Cape, we have um, communication infrastructure that is over 22 years old that is extremely obsolete and it has reached its end of life. And also um, there's old technology that is impacting the telephony system. What we have been doing to respond to that challenge is that we are now using voice over IP and we are using IP telephony as and when we are working. And also some of the numerous engagements that we had between CETA and uh, SEPS was to modernize the ICT infrastructure to ensure that um, we have current um, modernization, which is our key focus in this current financial year. Um, when it comes to also um, voice services, they play a very key vital role in combating crime in, in service stations we cannot afford to leave this old and obsolete infrastructure, we have to modernize it with immediate effect. One of the um, current work that we are doing as TMS and what we have been working on as a team is to respond to the FSL, which is the Forensic Service Laboratory, uh, which we are highly recommended that it, turn, it be turned into a project instead of it being in separate um, project deliverables so that it becomes a program, an end-to-end -end program, so that we can respond to the challenges. We have submitted um, a first draft to the um, to Colonel Stain, who submits on, on behalf of us to this committee. What we will do based on the information that we've heard today and we've received is to update that um, forensic science lab um, presentation um, and we will hand it over to our Deputy National Commissioner and our National Commissioner for submission for next week. And if there's any other further information that we need to elaborate on, we can. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the National Commissioner and the DNC. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, General. National Commissioner, are you happy? Thanks. Uh, General Mshalo responds on the main response. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members, Honorable Deputy Minister, Mr. Commissioner. On the, uh, uh, the that, that volume is not very good. Honorable Mesha, you may be excused. Um, uh, 
the sound is not very good. Can we try again? Good day, uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable that, Members. That's better. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, on the late response to complaints, um, the, uh, some of the interventions that were, were implemented as an African police service is to ensure that uh, to uh, intensify uh, the, the command and control uh, over our call takers, call dispatchers, but also including uh, the monitoring and evaluation of uh, the vehicles that are supposed to respond to the to the the complaints. We are ensuring that uh, uh, not only on a daily basis, but also weekly and monthly, we we do an analysis of the outstanding, uh, long outstanding complaints to ensure that uh, where it is as a result of uh, uh, the relation of duty of a particular member, uh, steps are being taken uh, either by the unit commanders, uh, including uh, provincial commissioners. Uh, we're also, uh, from our side, honorable chairperson and honorable members, uh, ensuring that uh, 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 we have regular meeting accountability sessions uh, between ourselves uh, and the commanders of the 10 one commanders. Uh, including even relief commanders, so that we can uh, sensitize them about the, the significance of uh, responding uh, uh, timelessly to all uh, complaints as they are categorized uh, in terms of Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. And we're also ensuring that we prioritize uh, our Alpha complaints, uh, uh, which are more serious in nature and, and still active, uh, to ensure that our response time uh, is actually uh, uh, adequate to all complaints. I submit. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you very much. Now, that was the last resp response that I'm going to allow. Um, all the um, question on whether there's a program to assist officers committing suicide. I told you that the Honorable Whip has asked this question more than once. I will give you until Friday. Friday morning, you have a number of questions to respond to. The Whip is not going to ask that question again because it would be the third time that the Whip asks this question. Could we have those responses? Nicolette, could you please list all the responses I expect for Friday? Next week, we'll be in recess. So when I reconvene, you'll be given an opportunity to do your final responses. But next week, I expect your reports in writing to me. General Massimola, you have done very well today. Um, this was your first time that you have been really grueled as a national commissioner. Congratulations, uh, General Masimola and your team. Uh, next time, you're not going to get off as easily as you got off today. Um, I'm not going to allow uh, the members' questions and the members' uh, concerns uh, to be left hanging. We'll come with that template. Uh, Deputy Minister will come with that template and we'll be measuring all these APPs according to a template. You have to be confident, National Commissioner, Deputy Minister and the team, that the performance indicators that you have given us are effectively monitored and that there is effectiveness of these performance indicators on the ground. We cannot just have performance indicators in writing. And then when you actually do engage with people on the ground, you find that nothing is happening. The second point I'd like to make is that the panel of experts inquiry 
into the July 2021 unrest and the hearings held by the South African Human Rights Commission on the July 2020 unrest has to be interrogated by this committee. Once the South African Human Rights Commission has concluded their report, they will refer that report to the speaker and that speaker will then refer it to this committee. We'll deal with those matters in detail, so please prepare yourself and you can start giving us a plan of action which details your response to the panel of experts' recommendations. That was the first report we received. National Commissioner, the second report we received was from the high panel after the Marakana Commission of Inquiry. We still need a program of action for that. Thirdly, there's the Mufamadi report on state security and how it also impacts on crime intelligence. We now, uh, I want to report on the Mufamadi report as well. We have a very young, vibrant female general appointed for TMS. You are going to be under severe scrutiny. There's equipment that we know of which is not being used. The minister came to the committee, spoke of the minister of justice, the minister of defense, the minister of state security, the minister of communications, who all had to give permission. We are long past getting permission. You can no longer tell us that you still need permission from other ministers. When we ask those other ministers if you need that permission, they say, but you haven't come to them. So we want proof that you have communicated with, in writing with, with other ministers if you need their permission for certain ICT equipment. Next, the president assented to the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act 2019 on the 20th of November, 2019. SAPS was instrumental in the drafting of the act. The act becomes operational once the Minister of Police appoints the Critical Infrastructure Council. When will these candidates be vetted? The Portfolio Committee submitted names to the Minister for appointment. Could you please respond to me on the vetting of these candidates? Next, the department should also indicate what progress has been made with the drafting of the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act regulations. We have to bring those regulations to the committee, please. Finally, and again, as we said, we congratulate you on the appointment of uh, a dedicated person for TMS. But SAPS has been lagging behind in digital policing compared to our counterparts, even in the continent. The aim should be to police smarter and not harder. There's very little mention and you're only beginning your digital or e-policing, but in your APP, this APP of 2022-23, you have very few targets for e-policing and the targets for the modernization, those targets have been severely reduced. There has to be coordination between what you do in SEPs and what you do in the civilian secretariat. The Civilian Secretariat is also developing an e-policing policy, moving towards modernizing the SAPs and the attainment of the 4IR policing environment. 
I do not want you to come back to this committee and tell us that all these policies are being developed in silos and that they do not speak to one another. We have to leverage technology to combat crime and be more efficient. The lack of technology will further jeopardize the successful implementation of the Safer Cities Framework. In conclusion, Deputy Minister, could you please prepare with the National Commissioner and convey to the Minister that we want your district development model for policing. We have yet to uh, present your district model, uh, district development model for policing to this committee. For now, honorable members, I can safely say that um, we have done quite a bit of work today. Uh, Deputy Minister, please convey to the minister that um, you have done well today. Congratulations, General Masimola, for this first attempt. But could you come to me on Friday and tell me if I am going to have an unqualified audit report? If you are not, I want to know if you are going to underspend, two, if you are going to have an unqualified audit report, and three, that, as I told you, those critical posts will be filled. I gave you my list of five priorities. Kimberly, General Vuma, please keep my, my integrity intact. General Rick, next time Kimberly complains, I'll tell them that it's your responsibility and that you are actually the one uh, they should be looking for, because you're also from Kimberley. Uh, Deputy Minister, thank you very much for all the hard work and for being in the committee consistently. We'll see you again on Friday. The committee is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Wap. Thank you, DM. See you Thanks on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, sure. National Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, General Reed. Thank you, General Vuma. Thank you very much, General Labia. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, uh, the Deputy Minister and the Honorable Members. Thanks, my colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Recording stopped.